Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. If you're watching on YouTube, you can find out more about what we do at officehours.global. Our first hour is general discussion about media and virtual production. Second hour is usually something we want to spend a little bit more time on, and we are super excited about this second hour. We've got a Mark Conig Coniglio and uh, an L. Wilson Spiro, who's going to be here uh, from Troikatronics, as well as Andy Carluccio from Zoom. Uh, so we're going to be talking about updates to Isadora and IzzyCast, which we're super excited about. So, um, so stay tuned for that. And if you've got questions, uh, then get them in there soon because I think there's going to be a lot of them today. All right, let's go ahead and jump into the questions. Mitch, what do we have? Thank you, Alex. Our first one is from Mike Edwards in Brooklyn, New York. Morning, guys. As a jack of all trades camera, field work, live streaming, and studio records, what are your thoughts on the Sony FX30 in comparison to the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 6K series? Good, Mitch. Um, I can't speak so much to the uh, Blackmagic camera. I can say that the FX30 um, has pretty much everything that the uh, uh, the Sony FX3 has, except the sensor. It's a Super 35 sensor in there. But it does have that wonderful Sony autofocus. So that's my vote uh, for the FX30. Autofocus is worth all the uh, all the shekels. Yeah, I think that the, your major, major, the main advantage that you have uh, with it is the autofocus. So if you're doing run and gun, a lot of YouTubers, I've talked to a lot of them, like, why are you using Sony's instead of Blackmagic? And it's generally because they're using autofocus. So, so, um, so the autofocus is the big, the big thing that keeps um, that you might want to look at there. Um, the to get the full quality records, it does do records internally up to 4K 120. But to get the full quality, you're going to need an external recorder. It it does uh, raw out the HDMI, uh, 4K RAW. So you want to take that into account is there's probably an added cost there that's there. And then the other thing for you to think about, the big advantage of the Black Magic is color adjustments on the camera will be much easier on the Black Magic camera. Um, you know, general, the general interface is significantly better than Sony's. <laughs> like, you know, so generally working with the camera and getting your setup done with the camera is significantly easier with Black Magic camera. It also fits into a part of a larger ecosystem if you're going to use it with a switcher or something else. But if you're doing run and gun um, for social or news and you don't need those features, you're probably better off with the Sony. Uh, next question. Next question from Scott Halver in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Has anyone with an Insta360 link tried placing it in a teleprompter, perhaps a prompter people desktop series? I almost did it yesterday. <laughs> I didn't quite get enough time. We've got a bunch of teleprompters laying around at the office, and and uh, we have. I'm using uh, for uh, the the Michael Krasny show uh, for Gray Matter. I'm using the little Insta 360, and I was thinking I should put that into a little teleprompter, but I just didn't quite have time to get it all set up. But it should work fine. It's just a quarter twenty setup. The big problem that you have is getting the camera close enough. This is the part that slowed me down. Is that I had I realized I'm going to have to build a separate feature for the camera because where in most teleprompters the um you have you know the, the mirror and the monitor but the mount is back here because most cameras are going to be a big camera here and then it's going to have a lens and so the mount is back here if you put the little teleprompter in there, there's way too much room between there you need this webcam to be right there behind it and so um, i realized i'm going to have to build a separate mount that's what delayed me yesterday was i have to build a separate mount to get it out there, which can be done, just needs, I just needed more hardware than I had. So, but that's the thing to think about when the teleprompter is, you're probably going to, we'll work on figuring that out. I do think that it's a good, um, it's a good solution. Uh, go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, some prompters have a mount that actually pushes the, uh, the center point away to, to make room for the lens. It might be interesting just to turn that mount around and that might get you right to the, uh, to the, to the glass. Yeah, the, the, ways that, the, way, the ways that, the ways that ours, most of them are built I don't think you could swap it. I don't think you could move it that way, but you, you could build, a again, a separate plate to move forward. The other thing that we've done in the past with um, the, the 920s, this is maybe 10 years ago, is we basically took the, they took the glass and then we, we built a vacuum form that just formed and then just bumped out like this for the, for the 920 so that you could just pull it up and it was just, it doesn't, you, you don't have a big camera there. So one of the things that I've been thinking about specifically with the Insta360 is building a little platform, putting the 360 here and literally just vacuum forming it into the, into the lens, into the thing, because it's so small, there's not really any reason to put it on, have all that rigging behind you that all that rigging behind you is for a big, heavy camera and a lens. You don't have that. I think you could actually mount it right to the back of the glass um, and then just pull it up and now have the, the, and I think that's a, 
It's a pretty solid solution <laughs> based on experience that I've had with less sophisticated cameras. And so, uh, so we're going to be testing that. The one bummer about that is the fact that the, the USB cable itself wants to go straight out. And so you have to, um, we're looking for a good L, um, a good L uh, adapter to, to, to tie that in. But that's, that's the next little piece of, that we're trying to solve to put this into, a, into basically a piece of glass there. All right, next question. Next question is from Tom Ferguson. In Phoenix, Arizona, is there a webcam viewer app for the Mac that can airplay to an Apple TV? Go ahead, Jason. Um, yeah, I, there is. It's called QuickTime. QuickTime should I don't think work. you can do... I tried oh, you can? that. I don't think you can. I tried that before the show. Keynote? I saw this. I, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Keynote would do it. Yeah, you're right. Keynote would do it. So if you used, if you opened up Keynote and you went full and you added a camera and went full screen and then told the, told Keynote to share to an Apple TV, you would get it. I don't know what, I don't know if the frame rate would be what the frame you want. rate's going to be rotten. Yeah. It could, it could be rotten. Um, I don't know of any like pure viewer. I think that the, you know, the other things that I was thinking about that was probably a little bit more complicated would be the Sienna NDI viewer and then something that's going to pass the webcam via NDI to the, I mean, it seemed like that was going to be a more stable solution than AirPlay. Um, I think it's not the cheapest solution. I don't know. I would take, I would take some, if Apple makes something in general, it's probably going to be optimized for an all Apple workflow. But I mean, in this case, I just don't, yeah, I don't know. So I think that probably OBS will do NDI. I believe you could also do Mima live or Ecamm, you know, all of those should be able to view those and then pass it via NDI to, uh, as a source for Sienna. Uh, next question. Next question in from Paul Valhus in Austin, Texas. Microsoft just rolled out a new video calling experience for chat for Microsoft Teams on Windows 11. Anyone tried it? Uh, Jason? No, I haven't, but I bet they did because on September 13th, there was a nasty um, hijacking, I'll call it a zero day a vulnerability that was disclosed by Vectra.ai. And um, they probably want to secure their enterprise clients against that. So, yeah, no, not a good thing. I think I, I will admit most most of my energy is spent on production level video conferencing as opposed to, uh, you know, chat level <laughs> video conferencing. So uh, I don't think that I don't, I, I'm going to assume that what Microsoft rolled out here. I mean, they, they did make an, a, a, at least an attempt at doing something with Epifan on the, on the connect. I don't, that, that event didn't turn out very well. So it didn't, didn't have me look at, look at that very, very, very closely. But, but I think that um, this is probably just more of a, a chat, which I think that Microsoft has a great ecosystem. They're going to, they're going to keep on adding uh, video to different aspects. I don't know if it affects folks like us that much though. Uh, next question. About that. Uh, Chris Widener, Lafayette, Indiana. I was asked last minute to join a Zoom meeting, but was on the road, had a good camera, mic, and laptop. But as the light faded outside, I couldn't compensate. What key fill lights would you say would work best on a grab handle in an SUV? Go ahead, Jason. Um, I will leave the the key fill part of it to um, to the rest of the the answerers. The the important part with that particular handle is getting the right grip on it. Um, I'd say a small rig clamp with a quarter inch uh, thread and then an, um, a, a magic arm would uh, would do the trick. KBUM twenty seven thirty two from uh, from uh, what is it? Small rig works perfectly. I go ahead, John. I would throw a Pavel tube uh, 6C on it. I think that would probably get you the right amount of lighting you would need. Uh, battery powered, uh, very flexible. Good, Mitchell. Like these uh, Luma cubes. Uh, this one's turned down so I don't wipe myself out, but uh, they're very handy and they've also upgraded them. So uh, you can take this part right here. It's got a quarter 20 and you can attach it to anything like a magic arm, which was suggested. Yeah, I probably, I probably embed them as, I mean, if I decide I was going to do this more than once, I'd probably embed them, embed the six C's, you know, like just, just put them onto the handles. I don't use the handle, but or build something that's really easy to pop them on. You might want a couple of the, the, the Nanlite six C's to put in a couple of different places because um, they're, they're pretty low profile and they're, they're large and have a lot of control over them. Uh, next question. Kyle Hammond from Chicago, Illinois, is looking for cameras to put on stage for a small theatrical production little to no budget, and waiting Osbot versus Insta360 link. What are the main differences? Um, I 
have not used the Ozbot, but what I can tell you is that the color rendition and the and the and the software control of the Insta three hundred and sixty is. I'd be really surprised if Ozbot has the same level of that, just because it's the best interface I've seen for a webcam ever made so far. Uh, go ahead, John. Yeah, Ozbot's color isn't great. It does have some decent low light performance. The sensor is much smaller than what's in the Insta three hundred and sixty, mm -hmm. uh, and since we're right around the same price point, I can't imagine going. Uh, away from the Insta360 versus the Ozbot now. Uh, we've deployed about 20 of them now at my office, and everybody's loving them. They look uh, great. You're, you're the Insta360? Yeah, the Insta360. Yep. Yeah. Uh, it's the best webcam I've ever used. I mean, you know, and, and I, I'm pretty picky. I buy a lot. I have a lot of webcams sitting around my, my office because I buy everything that says, every webcam that says 4K, I buy it and just, like, how is it working? And is it better than the Brio? And we couldn't find one that was better than the Brio until the Insta 360, and it's a lot better, you know, not not a little better. Next question. Next question in from Alexander Knight in Vancouver, BC, Canada, and here on our panel. Do the A10 Mini switchers accept 4K input signals and scale down automatically to 1080p, or do you have to send 1080p from the camera output? Go ahead, Jason. No, they do not. But if it's a Blackmagic camera, it will recognize as part of the handshake that it um, that it needs to send 1080 and make the necessary adjustments. But um, by default, no, you can't just throw 4K at it. Go ahead, Peter. Uh, to, to extend past what Jason just said, any device that tries to send 4K at it will negotiate over the uh, HDMI and will now send 1080p. It, if it's naturally... Um... Uh, a, a four, you know, like, so if you're doing 4K out of an SDI and then going through a converter, it may or may not uh, do that, I don't think. But but I know my computer was, computer I, I'm, the computer will negotiate. Yep. And no, you don't absolutely. get a vote. And you don't get a vote. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Unless you run it through some kind of EDID lock. You know, that would be the only other reason that you, you that locks it at a resolution. Um, next question. Todd Rains in Allen, Texas. Todd asks, do you recommend to use FireVault disk encryption on your Mac? Any downsides? Go, Peter. Well, depending on where you work or what, what your personal preferences are, I mean, I didn't get a vote for probably 20 years about encrypting my hard drive, and thus, even with the uh, solid-state drives, encrypting them, that, that was mandatory. Um, you're protecting your information, and it is possible to... Uh, if Protect it from really, yourself. Yeah. Well, I, I've never had that problem, to be honest with you, but I'm very good at remembering what my encryption password is right that's the, right and that's, that's, that's the, the key. key that's the key <laughs> uh, my my daughter brought me back she brought me back a laptop and she forgot her uh, encryption password and i said well i guess we start over i i have to admit that i um i bought very early on i got one of the the samsung before the t5s there was like a t1 or t3 or whatever that i bought and it had like its own encryption built onto it and somehow i got it I, I misplaced the or didn't have the password that I they had set for it and I lost it and I've never encrypted anything again. <laughs> like like I was just like I lost whatever I, I fortunately there wasn't yeah. anything important on it, but I was like But the downside is the idea. password is the, is remembering the password, really. Yeah, exactly. Go ahead, Jason. Okay, so as with real crypto, if you forget your password, that is definitely a downside. Uh, I can tell you having done disk recovery on these, um, it is shocking how in, in the name of efficiency and speed, um, modern SSDs basically leave things on, in the clear for a very long time. So I understand that if you're not encrypting your disk in some way, shape or form, um, there's a great chance that mm -hmm. stuff you've deleted is recoverable. Um, so just think about that. Go search. And think about all the security issue that having data on rest not encrypted. Uh, we just heard a few weeks back that Teams save your password with a token in clear text. So someone with access to your computer will have access to your Teams account, and then the mischief can just go wrong. Bing, that's exactly the thing that I was talking about. Thank you. Uh, and uh, anything that has my critical information on it, uh, no one, even in my family, has access to that computer. Like just, you know, like no one has the passwords, no one has access, no one has, you know, I mean, you'd have physical access if you came to the house, but uh, I won't generally even let you touch it when I open, you know, if I'm in public, I won't like hand it over for you to type something in. <laughs> so, so it's, um, so you want to take that into account. I think you Alex, through. you are using more uh, a fixed computer versus using a laptop. 
No, and, even, and, but I'm saying even with a laptop, uh, if I take a laptop into the, if I have important information on a laptop, I will take it everywhere that I go. Like it's not, you know, and I, uh, you know, so I don't leave my laptop, you know, that, that has it, that has key information on it around. Um, that's the, I mean, so you just have to be careful. Phys physical access is the, the thing that gets you. Go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah. If I should unexpected, uh, unexpectedly expire, uh, my password is one, two, three, four. <laughs> there you go. Thank you, uh, Alex, Alexander. Yeah, the only caveat I'll say with this is with certain special applications. And unfortunately, it's 2022 and Avid Pro Tools still does not support File Vault. They basically say use at your own risk. They have never really said why it they don't recommend it, but it may the you know, Pro Tools may not perform reliably with it. So I just leave it off for, for Pro Tools. Thank you, Peter. Well, and one last to think about back to your point. Alex, about, you know, what tools, but also think about what data you're protecting. Alex kind of hinted at it, important to him, but if you are running any sort of business and you have HR or financial information on, on that, on that system, it needs to be protected by law. Yep. Uh, go ahead, uh, Jason. Last, last thought. Um, it is an entirely separate issue whether or not you choose to synchronize that uh, decryption key with iCloud. Um, that uh, by itself has a whole host of other issues that um, that probably outside of the scope of the question. But um, yeah, keep your key. Uh, next question. Alexander Knight from Vancouver, BC, Canada, and here in the panel. How good is the H.264 encoding quality of the ATEM Mini Extreme ISO? Other than maxing out the bit rate, does Blackmagic expose any other encoding settings to optimize quality? Go ahead, Mitchell. I, you know, generally, if you're going to be editing, I just don't like the idea of H.264 as a, uh, um, as a master in format. It's just got issues with... Uh, uh, with the editing side, but if you're running stuff that you're going to show to people, things like that, uh, I've seen the H.264 from the ISO. It looks fine, and I don't, I don't believe you have any adjustments over it. It just is what it is. Um, yeah, so uh, I think that, yeah, it's better than a lot of other options. I mean, definitely, if you're trying to record eight, eight inputs, you need a lot of hyperdex, or you need a lot of something to get a higher quality than what you're recording here. So, you know, it may be worth the trouble to do it. Um, but, uh, but I think that that's the thing you yeah, definitely want to definitely want to think through. Go ahead, Peter. Well, what I one thing I've done a couple of times is also record locally in the camera and just use the H264 to figure out what I wanted to cut, and then go back and recut using the the 6k masters six and that, make, that that works really well. I mean, being able to pull those in. And again, if you're like, for instance, one of the things that we're looking at is being able to record ISOs from Zoom, using Zoom ISO to the, to it, you're not going to get a higher quality, by, you know, like the, the Zoom ISO is coming out at the, at a resolution that is, that is a lower bit rate uh, um, than, than what the extreme records. So if you're recording a bunch of um, Zoom ISO uh, records, it would be fine. If you're recording yeah, a bunch of cameras that are there, you want to make sure that those cameras, the big thing is, is if you are, recording cameras and you're going to use that footage, you really have to get your color right in the cameras. So your landing point is a lot smaller than if you have, if you're recording log on the camera, you've got a lot of room for error and everything else. If you're recording H.264, H.264 is not designed as a as a as an archive um, or even mezzanine. It is designed as a delivery format, and that delivery format throws away everything it doesn't think you're going to need. Which means that if you make any major uh, color correction or lighting or anything else that's in it, so if you're trying to bring up some darks or move color around, you're going to start seeing banding and all kinds of other things there because that information just isn't there anymore. It 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 only worked for how it looks. So you have to be. It just requires you to be much more precise. Um, or being willing to live with <laughs> the color that you're that you're generating. Um, does that does that answer your question, Alex? Yeah, it, it does. I, I've been wanting to move to. I, I've been recording ProRes in software on my computer, but I like the reliability of an external hardware unit. So that's why I've, I've been trying to move towards. That. I've been looking at Atomos recorders and stuff like that. Maybe the new HyperDeck Mini 
because I'm going to be moving to an a, a ATEM Mini switcher soon. So um, that that's my main thing. And obviously ProRes edits a lot better. So that for me, that's the main issue that I, that the main reason why I want to actually use it. But I was just curious. I, I have to do some testing to see how they encode. What are you recording? Are you recording from cameras or from Zoom? Well, no, I'm I'm recording directly from from the cameras into the into mm -hmm. the switcher, and I'm fine with baking in the color. I, I know the co what I I'm not going to be doing any kind of color correction in post, kind of because I just yeah. need to reduce the amount of time that I spend on this stuff. But yeah, the, and, but and ProRes and, does look a little bit better than H.264. Just oh, it's going to look a lot better. Yeah, so that's why I want to use it. <laughs> yeah, it's going to look a lot better. I mean, you're better off with it. With you know, you're better off with. A, I mean, if you can afford it, a bunch of little ATEM minis. Um, you know, the A10 minis have not been as stable for us as the hype, the, the, you know, I'm not, the, not the A10 minis, the Hyperdeck minis. They've not been as stable. The older versions have not been as stable as the Hyperdeck, you know, the SSD versions, um, which have been fairly stable for us. We have stacks of the Hyper, the, the SSD versions of the Hyperdecks that we just record to at, at a time. Um, and those have been, you know, very stable and we use them a lot for, for ISO records. Um, but, but I think that the, the, uh, the minis have been, 95% is stable. <laughs> so, so you always want a little bit of extra. And a lot of times we're recording, what kind of cameras are you using? Yeah, the Panasonic uh, Lumix FZ300. Right. It's an older camera. Yeah, I don't know. Absolutely. So, so yeah, so your, your record is going to be important because it's internal recording isn't particularly good, um, you know, for, for that. So I think that's another, another challenge there for it you. Al it also shuts off after 29 minutes. So <laughs> not that you're bitter, but it, but I'm sure it avoided a lot of tariffs uh, in Europe. So the, um, I mean, that's why that shuts off at 29 minutes. And so anyway, uh, yeah, I think that, I think that you, you're probably going to get better than what the camera will record internally, but not as good as you could if you're doing ProRes. One thing I will say is if you're recording H.264, um, I would still, I know this will sound crazy, but I would still conform everything to Apple ProRes before I started editing, even to LT, um, just because uh, it's, you know, it's not a, um, it's not a great Final Cut and other apps will import it and say that they can use it, but you, there's all kinds of trouble. When you start putting in um, formats that are not designed for editing, um, you can actually edit an entire piece and have it crash on render, you know, from Resolve and Final Cut and everything else where it just, it, and so then, then you're spending in the next day trying to figure out how to get it out of the editing system. So just be, be careful. And we've had that, I've been, I've had a front row seat to that for a couple of days. I was trying to figure out why something wouldn't export period. And it was because we had some, you know, goofy format in, in the edit somewhere. Uh, go ahead, um, Mitchell. Yeah, if you have a, a long gop uh, edit session going, it's hard to depict the actual edit point where it's going to work. Mm -hmm. It's it just kind of very elusive. Yep. Next question. Douglas Carmichael is here with a question. NDI Audio Direct enables any audio application to receive or transmit NDI. Would NDI support in hardware devices like the Direct Out Prodigy series, there's a link for it, help drive broader adoption of NDI in the audio world? I'd be really surprised if NDI makes a huge impact on the audio world, but I could be wrong. It seems to be doing pretty well with video, so I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. But uh, there's a lot of formats there right now that are doing pretty well. Um, so I, I, you know, I don't, you don't hear a lot about anything other than um, Dante, Maddie, and Ravenna. Like, I mean, I don't really hear anybody talking about anything else. But I think that NDI might do better than, than Dante does in video. <laughs> they have it, but uh, I don't, I've never seen it actually in the wild used by any production. Uh, go ahead. Next question. Next question from Laura Thompson in Beaumont, Texas, USA. And here in our back end, thinking about alt text, when you post an image to any social media platform, do you ever think about this? particularly if you're posting for a business purpose. Go, oh, Jason. Absolutely, I do. In fact, I have, a, I have an easy shortcut workflow on Mac OS that appends that, um, that alt text to the metadata of the image so that I don't have to think about it. So yeah, that's actually just part of my outsized workflow. Uh, next question. Todd Reynolds, North Adams, USA. Uh, speaking of webcams, has anyone checked out the Opal camera? Same price point as the Insta360 link. And there's a uh, link there for it. Uh, yeah, go ahead, John. I have pre-ordered one, but it has not arrived yet. So I'll be looking forward to testing that out. Uh, it doesn't do the pan tilt zoom stuff, but it is a larger sensor uh, webcam 4K. So it's going to be very interesting to see how the software shakes out. Yeah, I, 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 I will. It'll be interesting to see. I will say that the 
the pan tilt zoom, like truly a, a mechanical pan tilt zoom of the Instant 360 is much more impressive than at first I, you know, because I have both the ability to zoom in as well as the ability to move, really move around. Um, and it's, it's a pretty, pretty impressive solution. And the big thing is I can use the Insta360 as 4K. I can give it as, as a 4K input and then still pan and tilt, <laughs> pan and tilt around in it. Um, and, and, I, and I just have to say that like after now that I have it, you look back on the life of reaching up here all the time and trying to move it around and you're just like, oh, I just move it. I just grab onto the little interface and move it. So my only wish is that, well, I have a couple wishes for the Insta360. One is, is that there's a remote control, like I could remote into something other than having screen capture, which is what I'm, I'll be doing for some of the kits that we're sending out, is just I'm going to send a computer with it so that I can control it. Um, the second is uh, that I really hope that they build a 499 version or a 399 version that has HDMI out. <laughs> like that would be super useful. Uh, next question. Next question in from Kenneth Jones in Seattle, Washington. This is probably one of those it depends questions. But anyway, as a rule, is it better for the MacBook to put all peripherals on one Thunderbolt port or to split them half and half to two Thunderbolt ports? What difference does it make? Serge? I always try to maximize the number of ports I have. If I have a MacBook Pro with four ports, I would try to have the power on one port, the USB dock on the other one, and maybe my dock will not be Thunderbolt, my dock will be USB. So mixing them, it's not the greatest idea. Go ahead, Peter. Well, it absolutely does make a difference because the reason they put multiple Thunderbolt processors on the die is to split the buses apart so that you have, mostly on a MacBook, it's left to right. So two on the left is you know hooked up to one bus and two on the right is hooked up to the second bus. They are separate buses going into the processor itself. So yes. And as a matter of fact, you can actually see that on the new MacBooks because on the new back MacBooks, they actually steal part of one of those dies to do the HDMI and the and the and the SD card reader. They actually steal it. And on your on your extremes and so forth, they got four of those landing pads already built onto the chip. So that's why you're getting all those Thunderbolt ports on the on the extremes, on the ultras, I should say. I go ahead, Jason. Yeah, Kenneth, you're correct. It it really does depend. And uh, Apple has made MacBooks that uh, have two Thunderbolt ports, but only enumerate as a single bus. Most of them don't. Most of them do actually each have their own bus. So I'll, I'll, I'll answer your question. What difference does it make? The difference is that some hardware uh, likes to be enumerated on its own channel. And um, if any of that is picky in that way, you'll find out really quickly. Yeah, one thing that I do is I tend to split up what I consider junk traffic and then I AV traffic onto the two different buses. And so I don't split them across there. I have a, if I'm going to put a, you know, some kind of uh, USB, you know, breakout or something like that, I put that on one bus with the power, typically, <laughs> like, like, like that one gets to all the little things, the keyboards and little things all sit over there. And then the other two inputs that I have, generally, I find that I can put my webcam and my audio interface into, you know, whatever I'm going to put in there on the other two. I don't try to split those across those because, and this is my theory, is that the the stuff that's chatty, I don't, I just want to leave that on its own bus. Um, and the problem you end up with video a lot of times is that it's, that the chatty stuff is breaking up your video or causing trouble. Go ahead, Peter. And also, the one thing I forgot to say is, depending on the age of your MacBook, where you plug in the source of power makes a difference, as it turns out. Though it will, in fact, cross a, go across. It's a lot more stress on the hardware itself if you plug the power in on the right side yep. than on the left side bus. Turns so out, believe it or you, not. if you plug it in exactly where the MagSafe used to be. B. It, you're, you're it works good. great. You're good. <laughs> so, yeah, it, it heats up a lot. You'll be heat, uh, there's more heat if you plug it into the other side. Uh, next question. Elliot Robinson in Las Vegas, Nevada. Does anyone have experience with 5G business internet being offered in some cities such as Las Vegas? For example, Verizon offers 100 megabits down for $69 a month. Uh, go ahead, uh, John. 
What I've noticed oh. is most markets, the uh, 5G service, at least offered by Verizon, seems to be under bandwidth, meaning that they're oversubscribing to the point where the actual LTE towers uh, functionality is actually performing better than the 5G. While 5G will provide more bandwidth overall, I just don't think they have enough of them lit up or enough of a, enough bandwidth provided to actually perform that service well yet. Go, Jason. Yeah, um, so this is a, a nice lint-free cloth, and I'm convinced that this is basically impenetrable to um, 5G service. So um, let, let's just say, yeah, I, I wouldn't go there. I would use it as fallback at best. Go, Jen. Yeah, I, I live in Las Vegas. I'm hearing mixed reviews about this service around Las Vegas. So there you go. Yeah, 5G, The here's the problem that I'm going to guess that's going to happen in 5G is that Las Vegas already has a problem that no one wants to put transceivers anywhere. Like they don't want the look of them or whatever. And so you end up with just everything's over, everything's oversubscribed all the time, at least in the, in the strip, you know, it's just very, very hard to get your cellular to work very well or get any kind of real bandwidth um, because everyone has all these pretty buildings and they don't want to add things to them. Um, and so the challenge really is, is can you cover that area dense enough to get the kind of performance people need? As Jason said, it's not going to go through very much. So, and I think that, you know, you really have to put a transponder like every 150 feet to get it to really, you know, have what you need. That works really, really well for small, dense cities as w and it also works really well for event locations. Um, now, I do think that some of the stuff that Vegas is trying to work on, I think, could turn out really well, especially for conferences, if they can move that 5G, their, this municipal 5G that they're, that we were talking about a couple days ago or whatever, I think has a lot of legs, but it, hopefully it's going to be matched with enough investment from the city to make sure that it's really, they're just coating, they just got to coat the city with, with transponders, and it'll be interesting to see if they actually pull that off. Go ahead, John. One thing to consider if you're looking at it as a backup is get an eternal external antenna that you can mount outside your building that's going to yeah. provide a lot better coverage yeah uh, next question but, but you know I, I i got an announcement for uh 6g 6g world is coming up so they're already talking about the next ponzi scheme <laughs> so anyway because it's all one big ponzi scheme at this point so they, they got to keep us investing in the new thing before but while we're working on the old one we're like hey this i'm not getting any return on this investment <laughs> but we'll talk about the new one all right next question Alexander Knight from Vancouver, BC, Canada, back again. Has anyone done any comparisons with respect to encoding time between Resolve and Compressor to deliver H.264 for YouTube? Good. Curious if Compressor performs better to convert ProRes to H.264. Go, Peter. Well, as you gently counseled me the other day, Alex, don't use Resolve to encode a 264 at all. It doesn't matter about the speed. Uh, the H.264... H.264 yeah. out of out of Resolve is junk. Like yeah, it's but, not. It's barely it's barely good enough for client review. And and like, I, I I do have because I have a spare Mac Mini running. I could just leave compressor running. I just send send ProRes. I now yeah. export in ProRes and send it over a compressor. Yeah. Yeah. Somewhere. Go, go ahead, Alex. Do we know why it's bad? Because I know they have presets, but you can also custom, like even if you customize the setting, set it everything to high, it doesn't matter. It's still. So it's good. just, it's just, you know, I, I can't say why I know that, but I can just say that I wouldn't use H.264. It's just, I, I'll stop there's, using a, there's a bunch of assumptions. It, the assumption from Resolve when you send out H.264 is that you're sending to a client for review, not that you're exporting it to put it up, to upload it. Just not the way that, it's not the thought process that Resolve has. It's like, why would you ever send a six, H.264 as a delivery format? And so it approaches it to get the maximum amount of speed in, its, in, in the amount, you know, it's H.264 compression at the, at the, and it discounts the quality so that it can get it out quickly because you're sending these out for client reviews. You know, you're, you're uploading, you know, you're gonna pop out on H.264 and then you're gonna send it to a client. They're gonna say, okay, I wanna change this, this, and this, but that's what it's good at. It's not good at, it's not designed as a delivery format. It's not designed as a final delivery system. Um, and the color, uh, the resolution, like there's all kinds of things about it that I couldn't figure out why it was so bad. And I was using it for stuff that I was uploading and it was not a good idea. So now I export everything as a, as a, typically, I mean, if I'm working in Resolve, I'm typically using Apple Pro as HQ as kind of an out export. Now I do do H.264 when I'm sending to a client for like, just show me the, let me show you the edit. 
you know, like I'm, I just need you to review the edit, not the color or anything else. I will send it to the client that way because it's fast and it's easy and I can just pop it out and throw it up on frame. But, but I think that um, when you start like, okay, now I'm going to actually put something out. You want to do H2, um, Apple ProRes HQ if you're working at a, depending on what, what level you're working at there, then take it into compressor. And I, I still think that from the consumer compression tools, compressor is the best and fastest out there. So it's considerably faster than media encoder. And I think it's actually a higher quality than media encoder. Um, and there's other, other, you know, handbrake is a lot cheaper, but obviously a lot lower quality. Um, and, uh, the big thing is, is the compressor is tuned to the Mac. So it is crazy fast. You know, when you, when you, you know, it's the, that, that team is obviously working with the hardware team. So the, it's got, it's taking full advantage of the M1. So if, especially if you're on an M1, you're going to want to use a compressor. Go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, if you live in Adobe world, then uh, media encoder probably is a good choice to use. Um, as to it being faster than compressor, I don't think so. I think That's compressor, serious. again, like Alex just said, it's, it's, it's pre, it's, it's purpose built to work on the Apple and uh, do its best job. But I like the adjustments on media encoder, especially for uh, converting files to go out to YouTube. Next question. Next question in from Paul Valhus in Austin, Texas. How do you find Zoom meetings for specific topics? Is there a go-to directory which is comprehensive and reliable? Go ahead, John. No. <laughs> it's really it's about finding no. community, right? So whether it's office yeah. hours for like mm. a YouTube show or finding a Discord, a Twitch, whatever it yeah. is, it's going to be connecting into that community and whatever method that they're going to use to connect with people is going to be kind of how you have to plug in. Uh, you may find stuff with local government or, you know, like a Tom board if that exists where you are. Uh, but most of it's just going to be discovery within interests that you have in like YouTube channels. Next question. Next question in from Alexander Knight, Vancouver, BC, Canada, for eventual delivery to YouTube. If I'm not going to color grade, is there any discernible quality difference between ProRes 422 and 422HQ? Is it worth the much larger file size? Go, ahead, Jason. Um, no, I'm I'm going to say no. The target data rate, if we're at uh, 1080 1080p at 29.97 for ProRes HQ. Uh, is 220 megabits um, for 422 it's 147 so it's it's like two-thirds of um of the other but like long story short no go ahead mitchell yeah i concur with jason i think a lot of that's going to get tossed out on the youtube uh, encode cycle and uh, you're wasting file size uh, to uh, deal with their compression if you're ever going to do anything else with it like, so if this is your archive of your show and you're, you're going to export it out, I would recommend HQ. If you're just going to output this and you have all your source and you don't care, but I would have an HQ version of it, uh, mostly because if you ever decide, oh, I want to remaster that for HDR or I want to, you know, do other, any, any kind of other work to it, um, you're going to wish you had the HQ there. There's not enough bit depth in the uh, 422 to properly, it's there, but it's not, it's, it's messy. So if you start stretching a 422 out, uh, I have to do this a lot, <laughs> HDR, and uh, you can take out HQ and stretch it a lot um, uh, with an H, uh, a uh, 422, you'll start to see the artifacts. You'll start to see um, basically stair-stepping in the skies, um, you know, in any kind of gradients, those types of things. If you start to, to change that color, the, the color, um, the dynamic range of it. So, and you may not need that right now, but I wouldn't have my only copy that I keep on archive, um, be something that I couldn't make that adjustment later. So that, that would, an HQ is a good safe one because you, you probably won't see any real difference with XQ. Like if you go to XQ, you're not probably going to get a ton of difference on an average video. Um, but you will in HQ. There's a big jump from HQ to, as as with the, the file size, there's a big jump in quality and how much data is sitting in that file. So if, um, if I was laying off archives, I would lay them off as HQ. If I was um, just uploading them so I can upload them to YouTube or, or uh, run them through a compressor and then running them up, I would just do 422. It's probably fine. Um, next question. Scott Halver in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Does anyone know an off-the-shelf monitor I can buy that can auto-reverse for teleprompter use. Uh, go ahead, uh, John. I use the high right monitors. They have uh, SDIN as well as HDMI, allow reversal, uh, mouse right to my uh, prompter people uh, teleprompter. Go, Jason. 
prompter people make some amazingly beautiful monitors that are extremely expensive. I think you're going to be better off with um, with um, uh, something in line that will do the auto reversal, um, unless you want to spend some real money. And if you do, you'll love it. Go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, it depends on what shelf you're talking about. If you're talking about B and H's shelf, uh, Lilliput will probably do the job for you. And there's a, probably a bunch of other le less expensive uh, options. Um, I'm not sure, but I think the Blackmagic Design monitors can do that too. The confidence monitors. I think they can. I, I know that the, the Lilliput. I think almost all of them will do it, and it's built into their software, so you can do it. You can you can swap it there. Um, the uh, the other, I mean, what was mentioned earlier, the, a lot of us use the decimators for that. The, so the the um, the HDMX uh, will do, will flop it, and uh, you can't go wrong with a decimator. <laughs> That's all I got to say. I mean, having a decimator in the, in the in the pack is is always a useful thing. Next question. Next one in from Brian Becker in Charlottesville, Virginia. Brian asked, "Has anyone run into the no desktop video device detected?" on a deck link card in a sonnet enclosure when setting up an M1 MacBook Pro. Previously, no issues using the card on a Mac Pro. Go ahead, Jason. Yeah, it's not common. Um, this typically happens if the display, if the clamshell is closed and it just needs to be able to enumerate, um, detect the display, and then you should be able to, to go out of your HDMI without any issue. The other way to do this, um, uh, OWC makes a tiny little HDMI plugin that um, just kind of fakes out that initial display detection, but you're burning CPU cycles if you do that. So I, I would just, um, you know, wait a second and then plug it in and you'll be fine. Next question. And it's Douglas Carmichael asking, why do IBM mainframes still use text art on their login screens? There's a link to it. Even in our age where PCs used in business can display graphics. Good, Peter. Well, the simple answer is it's, if it's not broke, don't fix it. And this was first done back in 1964, and there's no reason to change it for compatibility reasons. Now, the, the irony of that statement is, is you know, I don't know any more of any mainframes today that connect to so-called dumb terminals that only display EBCDA character sets anymore. They all display graph, they're all capable of graphics, but it's just the way they do it. And for those of you who don't know, the, the they use a different binary code too. They use a thing called EBCDA, which was designed back in 1963 as an extension to um, BCD at the time, binary coded decimal. And the whole reason that the characters are the way they are is to prevent the hole punches from being too close on the card. That's funny. <laughs> Jason. The short answer is because it's awesome. And it's not that the IBM mainframes are the only uh, devices that do this. Raspberry Pis do it. Ubuntu does it. The bootloaders that I've used over the years do this. It, it is a common practice. And as far as I'm concerned, haven't you seen Minecraft? Blocks are in. It's 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 uh, smaller to store and and it's more predictable than than graphics and so you'll see that like if you go into a lot of servers and so on and so forth that we use that if we're going into the management port it's all going to be ASCII you know and it's just a matter of they build those out because it's a, it's far more efficient and far more stable and you're more likely to especially if you're in a um, a low low graphic environment you really don't want it to be thinking about anything about where to put pixels so typically the ASCII um, fills that in because of the the, the way you define those is more efficient than the way you would define graphics. Go ahead, Peter. And the last thing I will point out is it's translatable. At countries where systems go to, if you go into multiple countries around right. the world, right. you want to be able to display in the local language. Yep. It's easier to translate either ASCII or EPSTIC into the native language than it is to redraw the graphic. Yeah, absolutely. Next question. <laughs> Next in from L. Wilson Sparrow in Berlin. Any experience or advice for working with Unreal Engine for live motion capture performances? I'm on a project using a Rococo mocap suit, and the artist wants to use Unreal. I'm planning to get video out via Spout and trying to control Unreal via OSC. Go ahead, Jason. My advice is test it to death, arrive early, and really, really, really test it. And once you're positive it's working, test it again, and then, um, and then you're good. And, and L, are you, you have the, Roco, the, the Rococo suit? Yeah, I have one sitting under my desk right now. And is it working in Unreal right now? Uh, I don't have it working in Unreal yet. I just found out that we're working with Unreal today. 
Got it. Um, yeah. So uh, the the person, by the way, to uh, reach out to to talk to about this in in Discord would be Nick Jeshishin from Drexel University. Um, Nick has a lot of experience in both motion capture and um, uh, Unreal and the integration of those in many many different uh, formats. And uh, so he's probably the right person. And, and if you have any trouble, L, getting a hold of him, just let me know, and we'll we'll get you guys. Um, talking together but he's the he'll solve most of your problems pretty quickly um in that in that area so um but the first step is getting there the the packaging of getting the rococo to work in unreal should be relatively simple there's probably a plugin in there that will deliver you the motion data pretty quickly um from there and then there's probably there is a and you're trying to just get video out of unreal or are you trying to get data out of unreal i'm just trying to get video out of it yeah yeah so that should be so it should be real it shouldn't be hard, but Nick, Nick is our in, our, not our in-house, but in the family expert that will probably be able to solve any, any roadblocks that you have pretty quickly. Uh, next question. David Brady, New York, New York. Are there any good known methods to ingest an IPTV stream and transcode it quick and easy to an NDI stream, hardware or software, not large scale for a small skunk works project? Go ahead, John. What I've done in the past is use VLC to capture it. And then I would uh, use the window scrape from like the NDI utilities to put that over uh, NDI from there. Go ahead, Jason. What John said, VLC for the win. Next question. Chris Widener, Lafayette, Indiana. With a 2K budget, any recommendations for a portable projector for video playback presentation use with decent speakers? Go ahead, John. I'm not sure about one with decent speakers. What I would recommend is at least 5,000 lumens, uh, preferably a laser projector. It's going to have a lot more brightness, uh, considering we don't know anything about the space you're projecting into. Uh, brightness is going to be key for you to have any sort of quality viewing experience. And by the way, for the for the um, for our our producers, we've got a little more room before the top of the hour. If you've got more questions, we've got a great panel, and we are slicing through these uh, with uh, incredible precision. So, so if you if you have more questions, go ahead and throw them in. Um, yeah, for two K, uh, I generally the two brands that that I would probably lean towards are Epson and BenQ, um, and I would say BenQ, you know, with a nose, you know, like it's 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 a pretty. Uh, it's it's a pretty good pretty good projector is mostly in that in that price range. Um, you know, once we start going higher up, we change brands, but but in the price range, I would say uh, BenQ is a, is a pretty good one. Go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, just to put that in perspective, I know I'm not suggesting this for your 2K budget, but uh, I was in the store the other day looking at a Sony Laser at sixty thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah, but the ben, but but BenQ makes ones that under five thousand are pretty good. All right, go ahead, John. I posted a link to a Sony. I find the Sony's look a lot better, especially from the lasers. They don't look as green. Uh, so there's um, there's that. It's in the uh, chat posted underneath your comment. Uh, next question. Next one in from Douglas Carmichael. What, in your opinion, distinguishes true community development and engagement from one-way content distribution? Is it scalable conversation? Alex mentioned a while back. Go ahead, John. For me, it's do I am I just consuming it or am I participating? So what we're doing here is participation. It's real time. We're taking your feedback, your questions and answering it versus if I'm watching some you know news show, all I'm doing is absorbing what they're putting out. They're not really caring about anything that I'm saying. They have an agenda and they're pushing that. Yeah, I, I think that it is a I, I do think that the future is community development. I think that w I don't think we're the answer, but we're pointing towards it uh, as, as far as what we're doing right now um, in in the sense that, yeah, it's, it's building that conversation. And sometimes the, what we hope to do is make a scalable conversation, which means a lot of people can have that conversation all at one time. Uh, I think that the on the far end, you have broadcast, which we're not listening to at all. We're just playing a show and you sit down and watch it and, and that's, and, and be happy. <laughs> you know, and, and you can talk amongst yourselves. You might build a community on your own, but you're using that content as a, as a place, but you're not really interacting with that content. Um, whereas you start to add interactivity when you start to take questions and start to, and that's what we're doing here. You take questions, you take polls, you take other things, let people interact with it. Um, let this, let people be part of that, that conversation um, and be, and really just be part of the, the, driving the conversation as opposed to being the conversation. The next step you see is, of course, the panelists view here, but we've done other things where the audience gets to affect the show, you know, and that can be, 
Uh, in some cases, um, that can be something that they're just adding things that add, a, add graphics. But we've had things, well, you know, basically kinetic integrations where we're, you know, setting off flamethrowers based on audience interaction and, you know, all kinds of other things. Audiences get super excited <laughs> about that, about that, that kind of interaction. So, so you can now make them part of that, of that conversation. Um, and I think that we can keep on moving down that path, but I think that people want to be part of something. They want to be a useful piece of something that's happened, that's, that's, that's moving in an area that they're passionate about. And so the more you can find that solution, uh, the more powerful the connection. And I think that we don't see that like with YouTube, we answer people's comments, but it's not really the same. So, so I think that um, there is like how active the audience is, is a, is a key piece to how tight, tightly wound the community is. Uh, go ahead, Jason. It's not in, in jest or by accident that we call our live audience producers. It's not, you know, yes, it is for the audience, but at the same time, the audience is the show. If we run out of questions, we're going to go into the second hour. Um, and to that end, it, it, it is even one step further to me than like, oh, let's, let's talk about some tweets or something. It, it, it truly is that the audience determines what we talk about. All right. Uh, next question. Douglas Carmichael asking, has anyone had experience with Zoom's language interpretation feature? If we could recruit enough interpreters, this could be an interesting experiment for Office Hours 3.5, 4.0. Yeah, I, we're trying to get the interpretation done faster than that. So I'm, we're working, you know, so we're looking at how to do that. I haven't tested Zoom's language interpretation. The one that I'm looking at right now is... Um, is specifically with EEGs or AI media's Alexi is the thing that we're starting to research, you know, to go down that path. So the way that um, the way that that works is that you can have either you can have Lexi, which is their their automated solution, um, caption everything, and then it can then spit out many languages. The most accurate way to do it is to have a captioner on the other side of what's called iCap, and so it connects to your hardware. That can be a 492 or an AV610. Um, and those are basically the difference between the 492 and the 610 is that the 610 doesn't embed, uh, captioning data into the, into the bank, into line 21. So it's just a, it just, it'll just print out, uh, you know, over the screen, it'll print it out. So this, there's in, anyway, but you basically tie ICAP and it can, it can all be done in software as well. Tie ICAP, ICAP and have a stenographer actually doing the first version, the English version of it, then take that data and have it and send it to Lexi and allow, allow it to generate as many languages as you'd like um, and then be able to put, push those back in. And so those are things that we're, um, now that's for captioning. Um, if we want to actually, um, you know, one that I'm interested in is being able to do auto dubbing, which is coming. Uh, it's not there yet, but taking, it's basically taking that text and going back text to voice and being able to drive multiple things, you could open it up and it would be, and we're not, I mean, when, when I say we're not very far away, we may see this in the next year of being able to see multiple languages being spoken back to you um, with very, very, very little delay. Like the, the, the tests that I've seen so far, the computer can give you back the translation faster than the human can. Um, you know, because it's, it's all being, you know, it's just, it's, there's not that human latency that's in between of listening to it and thinking about it. The computer does that really fast. Now the computer is not as accurate as the human. <laughs> so, so, the, so it's not quite as clean, but as contextual language starts to get better, what, the, what happens is, is it does start to slow down, wait and what it's not so much waiting to figure out what you said, it's waiting for context. So you'll see, like, if you, if you see Google right now, do it on the bottom of your, you meet or whatever it's waiting for you to say a couple more words. So it understands what the words are, what the contextual meaning is of those words. So it just waits a little bit longer and then puts them back in. So by adding that extra latency, you're able to get that, that back in. And then it's just a matter of turning that speech to text, which we're getting pretty good at now. If you listen to your Kindle, you've got a, you know, or, or, or your Mac, you've got lots of text to speech. So that kind of stuff's coming. Uh, we're definitely going to be experimenting with that over the next year, because I think it's really important. I, love using humans for this thing because I like the character of it. I like the thing, but you know, it's just not scalable, you know, to have, you know, you can't do a show like what we do every day. Um, we can't do it if we're hiring, you know, or spending $150 an hour, you know, on, on for every language. So, and, and some of them are not, one of the big things that's interesting about this is that, uh, there are languages that the computer can do that the humans can't. So for instance, Mandarin, Hindi, 
Um, in other, in some other uh, Asia Pacific languages, you can't caption by with a human because the the keys can't work that way. It can't generate the the alphabet. So um, so basically, you have to use the AI to generate the, that character set as opposed to a human um, if you want to do it live. So those are all. Um, and again, it's not as um, not as accurate as a human would be most of the time. Um, but it also depends on the libraries. A lot of times humans will um, listen to listen to a, a, an event over and over and over again, and they'll put new things into their libraries so that they can type out what they want, you know, the new, whatever the new iPhone product is or Apple product or whatever, they'll type that all in to make sure that they get the name right. They'll get everybody's names right, that kind of thing. The computer, you just load that into a big, like always say these things. And with both of them, you can say always say, that, you know, this is what you're this is what you're solving for. And you can also say, never say these words. <laughs> like, you, know, you have a long list of things like whatever you think they said, it's not going to be one of these, you know, 86 words. <laughs> you know, like you just, 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 to, just take that out of your vocabulary. Go ahead, Peter. Well, there, there are two, que there's a question I would extend on, which is, do the AIs understand the vocabulary yet? I mean, I've run into some cases where in a highly technical field, translating the vocabulary doesn't necessarily work. Right. You, you you end up with some strange things and in it and I and apologies to Serge ahead of time. I've seen what happens when Shared Services Canada accidentally set Teams, which is what the government uses for communications, to French, not French Canadian, and the captioning function didn't quite come out right. Yeah. And the other thing you should always know when you do captions or, or subtitles is someone's always going to be upset. Like that's, that's part like any, anybody who speaks both languages are going to be upset. They're going to send you emails or texts or whatever that says that was completely wrong. And that's just the nature of doing it because no one's going to agree on what that should have been. Good. Next question. Next question in from Craig McFarlane in Boston, Mass. And uh, has anyone seen or used the app Hustle Up? It's a new movie production oriented jobs market app for short and medium length work. Nope. <laughs> so, so I, you know, the, the, here's the, here's the problem with all of these apps is that, um, all these services is that it's really not just about finding someone who knows how to do the thing. It's how they fit into the teams. It's how they put those things together. And m most of us that are doing higher end work at least won't use any of those because we just don't know what that person's going to be like when they get on set, you know? And so, um, it, it, it's not uh, detailed enough to give us the information that we need to accurately build a team. Um, and that's been the, the problem with Production Hub. Uh, I think Hustle Up is another one. They need a couple, um, I, I will say that they need three things that are very hard to acquire. One is certification. Does that person absolutely, can that person work at speed with the hardware that you're giving it to them? Number two is they need um, 360 reviews. How does everyone on a team all the time rate them? And, you know, and, and, and specifically, and then three, they need flight hours. How, how many times have they done this? <laughs> and so, so the, and it's almost none of these platforms have the tools that are required to make that work effectively. And it would take a huge community of producers, uh, of production people and, uh, and a system to make that actually work. And maybe you'll see that someday in the future. Next question. From Chris Widener, Lafayette, Indiana. Chris asks, what tools have you used, <coughs> excuse me, for outdoor decoration prepping, Halloween is right around the corner. Go ahead, John. I think he means mapping there, right? That's my guess. Yeah. Um, so I use a combination of Resolume Arena for the uh -huh. projection mapping. And then I use Atmos FX, the singing pumpkins, the ghost flying in the windows, the zombies, the spiders are all scenes that they provide and then strategically set up projectors. Last time I had six projectors on my house had 250 trick-or-treaters at my house. That's so great. Um, by the way, if Josh is listening, we need to do a second hour about Halloween soon because I've been thinking about John's thing and, I, 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 and I've been thinking about, I've been fiddling with some stuff in Isadora and I think, I think that I want to build an Isadora project that, uh, speaking that we're going to talk about that in a minute, but, but I am thinking about using Isadora to run my, my front door um, area with, I've got, I've got smoke machines, <laughs> so, so, so like smoke machines, lasers, all that stuff, have it react to people coming in. Um, so, so John, we should do it. We should definitely do a, a, a Halloween one next week or the week after and talk through through your thing. I'm warning you that we're going to come to you about that. All right, uh, next question. Douglas Carmichael asked, 
The Cisco Catalyst 9300 switches can support P2P and AES67. Is AES67 a derivative of Dante? When would you use AES67 P2P in an audio network? Go, Jason, real quick. We're going to move through this real fast. I wouldn't use AES67 because Dante works better. Long story short, uh, Dante can transmit to and subscribe from um, the interoperability. It's backwards compatible with AES67, but um, the, the problem comes when you've got an AES67 device that isn't in 239.x slash 16 address space. That's when you're going to run into problems. So, yeah, don't go there unless you absolutely have to. Go, John. And the PTP portion is just for clocking. It's a standard uh, to make sure that all the devices on the that are networking together are working at the same clock speed, which will be very, very critical for uh, audio and video distribution. So think of AES 67 more as an overarching standard that other protocols have been leveraging for compatibility. And now we're jumping into our next hour, uh, and we're very excited to have uh, Mark Coniglio and uh, from and L, L. Wilson Spiro from Troikotronics uh, here to talk uh, uh, talk to us, as well as our our, our friend Andy Carluccio coming in from Zoom. Uh, so, and um, today we're going to talk a little bit about updates to Isadora and IzzyCast. Um, Mark, can you tell us a little bit about what you've been doing since the last time you visited us? Oh, and you're you're muted, Mark. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, well, a good portion of that time has been spent on this new product that we showed as an alpha at the IBC trade show called IzzyCast. And the basic notion is that we wanted to be able, you know, several people had made productions during the pandemic using Isadora where they were screen scraping Zoom to bring those actors and performers in to make distributed performances or what we tend to refer to as remote performances. So actors and performers in different locations being brought together either to be shown in a theater with a limited audience or in the case of when it was really locked down, just streaming it out. So because of that and because of some other uh, stories that I can tell you, we then went down this road of really putting this in, making it integral to Isadora so that you'll be able to, with IzzyCast, which is really right now a collection of four extra actors that go into Isadora. Isadora itself really is not changed, but what there are are these four actors and they allow you to create a session and to be able to stream audio, video, and data into the cloud and then back out to all those copies of Isadora so that you can, you know, do what you do here in a way with, I know you, uh, you know, with Zoom ISO, but in a kind of a different context, because now you're bringing it directly into Isadora. All of the things that we love Isadora for its modularity, the node-based programming, being able to make a custom patch, those things all now are in play and you can really make a completely custom setup, but with high quality audio, video, and data coming to you. So I guess that's the nutshell description of what IzzyCast is all about. And and it, so, and just to kind of back up and, and, and describe this a little bit. So you're, it's basically using the Zoom, the Zoom infrastructure, but yeah. you have video and video on either end of, a, of an internet connection and there's no Zoom interface to it. It's just a, it's just basically saying, I have, I like I would look for a video card on my, you know, whatever I have, you know, I have well, look on a video card on one side and hand it to hand it there. And, but it comes out the other end as just, it, it just identifies as video. It's not, so there's not any. Amazing. Yeah. So for example, some of the things that you're used to in a zoom meeting, I mean, while you could make it probably in Isadora, they aren't there like raising your hand or sending a reaction, you know, those sorts of things. None of that's built in because what I'm using here is the Zoom Video SDK, and I might as well, I like telling this story because it's really such, it's really strange how things happen in life, and this yeah. one is particularly strange. So uh, maybe a year ago now, uh, an organization in Canada called, and I'm going to, my French is not good, so please forgive me if you speak French, but Sans Interactive Teletechnology, SIT. They are an organization mainly serving dance companies in the Montreal area and the modern dance scene, the contemporary dance scene is very big there. They wanted to have this capability to bring it into the set of possibilities for these dancers. So they contacted me because the, um, one of the main persons there, he's called Armando Menacachi, is a longtime Isadora user. He loves the program and also 
uh, has shared it with many um, of the local dance companies there through this project. So he, he said, we really want to be able to do this. He also has a bunch of other really interesting, crazy ideas. And I said, OK, I absolutely don't know how to do that. But I'm like, who knows how to do that? Oh, Andy, that liminal entertainment. Yeah, that, that's the guy. I'll, I'll write Andy, who I didn't really know very well at the time. So my initial reaching out to Andy was actually when it was still liminal. But then, you know, as things happen, Liminal was acquired by Zoom, and now Andy's at Zoom, but we wanted to continue the project. So because then the, the Zoom video SDK basically gave me everything that I needed in terms of these requirements, so because we were going to use stuff that Liminal had developed that was not Zoom, but then the Zoom video SDK was there. And so I just went down that road and used that infrastructure because, of course, I think we all know the advantages. You know, you you don't have to worry about proxies. And I don't even know, double, what are they called, Andy? Double <laughs> double nats and complex you know yeah. network architectures and all that because stuff, yeah. because zoom has worked all this out so all that stuff is already in place and so now we have a system where we can really do that and that part of it you know the part of actually getting the video working was not the the biggest percentage yet of what we're doing because the other side of it is that we have to develop a portal because okay so how does it work in the sense that like okay that it said it's four actors and it's just you know they're added into isadora but the key is is that to use those actors you have to buy minutes from me so or from troikatronics right so when you're going to do a production and it's not right now we are not at the moment, going to do enterprise pricing, although we will consider it on an individual basis when the time comes that we're actually doing this. But instead, the general principle is that you'll say, we'll have an actual calculator to help you figure out, you know, I have this many rehearsals and this many performers, and I you'll see how many minutes you need to acquire. You'll go to this portal, you'll you know, buy those minutes, and then they'll be in your account, and then you'll start using them. So, and, and roughly, how much does it cost per minute? Can you tell us? We do. I am. I am not going to say anything about pricing today. We're going to go mm -hmm. into. You know, the plan now is. I. I was saying at IBC that I it was kind of saying public beta, but because of the pricing thing and really seeing how the accounting of it works, because that's the thing we have to get right. right because right, I don't right. want to have anybody getting charged for minutes they didn't use. So mm -hmm. in November, we're heading towards a private beta where we'll put this in people's hands selected group of users and then we'll we'll kind of get all that worked out That's so great. i i hope that around the time of around the time of uh, zoomtopia and that time framework or november 8th or 9th and there we can announce the, what the pricing will be but you know uh, by the way for for those watching uh, in in my industry charging per minute is totally normal so you know we we charge um you know for the highest end connections that i that i use uh, it costs us um, about twelve dollars a minute. <laughs> so, so, so it's it's okay. uh, you know like I can promise you it's be cheaper than that. than that. Yeah, yeah. I that's, can promise you it's cheaper than that. That's uh, that's uncompressed, uncompressed HD. Uh, okay. You know, at, at, with a latency <laughs> under uh, fifty milliseconds uh, across okay. across the country. So it's 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 a pretty good it's a pretty good connection, but it's very expensive. Yeah. Um, well, and so, but but we charge, but we're used to charging um, three three dollars a minute, eight dollars a minute, or six dollars a minute, twelve dollars a minute. Those are all numbers that we're used to. And when you're doing production and you want it to be solid and connected and work inside your workflow, the, the cost per minute is not, I mean, obviously there'll be less than those. Those are different, a different kind of format, yeah, but, but yeah. the, um, but it, it's, it's a pretty normal way to approach, you know, the, the cost structure. So. Yeah. yeah. And I will also add that uh, charging per minute was not uh, something we chose to do. It's, it's something we have to do because of the, the zoom architecture that we're using is because that's, that's how we're charged. And so yeah. in order to make sure that, um, that is that is cash positive. Uh, you know, for the, yeah. in, in the prosumer segment or the consumer yeah. segment, I would think about like uh, like a phone plan with prepaid minutes or something like that. That's exactly what it's analogous to. You find the category that closest meets what you're going to need for your performance, and then we give you information to help you track consumption and estimated use and all of that stuff. But it's basically, you know, as Mark alluded to, it's the kind of the white labeling of Zoom as a protocol inside of the Isadora app that allows. I mean, in some ways, this feels like it's almost the, from the video aspect and the audio aspect. And we haven't even gotten into the data aspect. The the um, that it feels a little like how we use Zoom 
in, in own I know where we have point to point connections with every person. So instead of having right now, we have them all joined zoom. So we're getting ready to, we've been talking about moving to zoom ISO for a lot of this stuff. And uh, we're waiting for just a couple little things there. And, but it seems like this is a, the way we use it at the moment of building, I want to build a point to point with a whole bunch of people. This would be a pretty interesting uh, yeah. solution. Now, I do want to note that while you absolutely could set it up as as point to points between all the individuals, you're not um, required to do it that way. Um, because again, it is our it is our multi user architecture. Um, mm -hmm. So you could have the ability for um, peer to peer level video subscription without so having to have everything come into a central location, you actually could build something completely centerless. Um, if you wanted to, it's all, we give so that, you full so that works inside of the, well. inside of the is a cast network. You could have people talking to each other. Like we talked here again, it's, you know, at, with Isadora, you can build out any, you know, uh, architecture that you want. Mm -hmm. We basically gave you the zoom protocol as a sandbox for you to then build out in a nodal architecture, all of the behavior that you want inside of Isadora. So, okay. Yeah. That's really fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, and so, uh, so go, go ahead, Mark. No, I just going to say, I mean, this is where, you know, I mean, I mean, you know, we showed this, it was really kind of zoom to have us in their booth. And, um, uh, I haven't been to a trade show in 20 years. I, it's a funny story. The last one I went to, but it, I haven't been in a long time. So to be there, um, you know, it was of course frightening because basically we were showing this as an alpha. This was a great right. opportunity for us, but like, oh my gosh, I was like, you know, I was like coding until the very last day, of course. So now right. that, you know, the dust has settled, we've shown that, you know, it exists and that it works. And for those of you who didn't see it or didn't see the link, we do have on um, uh, a, a YouTube video uh, that is a recording Andy made with his phone, actually, of me doing the demonstration at IBC that shows IzzyCast in action. And it's good. I can also describe what happened in that if that's helpful, but um, but it's good to watch that. But so now that the dust has settled, we want to really sit down and start developing some because, you know, the thing is, not everybody wants to program Isadora. We know that. I mean, I love it. A lot of people who love it, love it. But like they see those nodes and they're like, mm, I don't I don't want to deal with that. But what we want to do is give you some presets for some absolutely solid use cases where you can put this to use. And one of the ones when we get to the data we can talk about, because I think one of the things people were most excited about by my demo was me. I had a you know, I was controlling a PTZ camera in Berlin from Amsterdam as well as the lights. And that was the data portion of this because I'm sending data to that remote location as the director getting exactly what I want, you know, in that space, right? So- well, tell um, us a little bit about the data. Like what, what yeah. kind of data can you pass? Anything, I mean, right. okay, yeah, you can't put blocks of like, I don't know, uh, you can't, <laughs> uh, like you wouldn't want to send a picture that way. That, that but, wouldn't be- smart. But you're talking about DMX, I'm talking OSC. about DMX, OSC, MIDI, any of the protocols that Isidore uses. I mean, on these, mm -hmm. so so the way, let me just briefly describe the four actors. Okay, um, there's the IzzyCast session creator. Only the director would be using that. They have this, the code, the special code they need to actually create a session. Because of course, if you can create a session, you start spending your minutes. And so one person, you know, will be given, you know, that will be the code will be in one person. That creates the session for someone who's the director. Anybody else who's using Isadora would log in using the IzzyCast session uh, client. So what happens is the director creates a session, a 10 digit code appears for them, and they give it to the to the other people. Now, part of this portal will be that you'll be able to pre-generate that code, just like you do with Zoom for a meeting. You pre-generate that, you tell all of your talent what it is. So everybody as, you know, the, the director logs on first and then everybody just enters the code, hits go, and they're in the session, right? So those are the two kind of admin actors, if you want to think of it that way. And then the other actors are the IzzyCast broadcaster and the IzzyCast receiver. And each broadcaster has a video, an audio, uh, a video input, a, a, a way to select the audio source, and then as many data inputs as you want to put. So you could be sending numbers, you could be sending text, you could be sending, you know, but basically any of the, the integral data types in Isadora, numbers, text, things like that, uh, JSON strings, you can send that through there. And then on the receiver end, you have 
the video audio, which you can then route to any speaker. If you have a multi-channel audio device, you'll be able to say, I want this person coming out of, you know, channel four and that person coming out of channel two. So how many, and, and how many channels can you send? We don't know yet. We have to try that, but okay. I mean, maybe Andy can make a guess, but I mean, it's zoom, right? So mm -hmm. I, I don't know, Andy, can you say anything well, about that? On the Isadora side, you can, you can pipe. Um, it's not, I think Alex's question is less of like how many concurrent audio channels can you get from the individual and, and more so how many on the multi-channel device can you point out to? And I believe Isadora just enumerates all of the available channels that the right. device has available and you can pipe, you know, if I had five incoming participant audio streams, you could put them to five different channels of that multi-channel output. Is that, is that right, Mark? Yeah. Well, and, and then for me, it'd be specifically six channels. Could I yeah. source, have six channels at the source and the receive and have those six uh, channels um, I, passed to it? I don't believe the Zoom video SDK allows you to send multi-channel audio. I, I actually don't know for sure, but I, I kind right. of feel like in stereo is the limitation. Maybe, But, but on, the, on the receiving end, I could acquire all of those and put them out in different Yeah, different so, channels. so let's say you have a, let's say you have a 16 channel audio device, right? And you've mm -hmm. got four people coming in and they're all sending stereo. So you have eight channels. So you can take those Right. individual pairs of channels and route them wherever you want to route them on the on the audio output or you could say this person is going to this audio device and that person is going right. to a different audio device like that right which is great for theater because you'd be able to sit there and have things coming out of different speakers and people right. coming you know i, I get but that i yeah. think I think any time that you were using this for a live situation, you want to spatialize the presence of those people. I think oh, yeah. it's super powerful because also you can pan that, that you can, you know, again, it's Isadora, right? We have real time control of all the parameters. So you could, you know. And that panning is happening actually, locally. So you're getting all these raw, raw audio data exactly, from other exactly. Izzy casts. And then that pan isn't happening over the internet. It's happening at the local space with the resolution that you would have at the local space. But for from internet sources. Is that is that right? That's correct. That's, that's correct. Incredible. Because that's what we did in the demo to in not with audio, but in a similar way. So, you know, because again, you know, my background and a lot of the people that use Isadora use it for um theater and dance and those mm -hmm. the performing arts, let's say, or video installations. I mean, I think that what we're doing here is going to open a whole new door to a whole different type of user that might be interested in this because i think some people from broadcast can you know definitely see a use for this um yeah. but but it, for our be, because of my background the demo was that you know at a certain point i was interviewing this person we had a kind of fake interview and yeah. then i hit a button to send a, a the numbers to the ptz camera to spin it all the way across and, the and so room what, and what protocol were you using for the ptz camera oh i have a new actor too that in isadora called uh the uh the visca ptz controller mm -hmm. and so and so now isadora can direct if you if it uh the camera it's accepts visca. visca then you can just control it with isadora so i had this actor running it told the camera to spin around and then i had a dancer in a rococo motion capture suit and i was sending all of the data from the suit from Berlin over to Amsterdam. And then it was doing a painting like, like strokes on the screen from the motion capture data from the suit live. So the point here, the data came from Berlin, but the right. image was super high quality, not compressed, not going through right. zoom or anything. It was rendered live there. And, and what was the, and how was the motion capture data sent? What was the, what, what was the it, protocol? I, I converted it into a JSON string. Oh, got it. Okay. And yeah. Okay. And, and I think that this, this is the really interesting thing here is that it, it really points towards these kind of distributed events that we're a lot of us are talking about right now, where, you know, we think of bringing people from a conference or even a th the theater experience, having it all happen in one place, we're all going to go to Broadway or, or whatever and watch something. But a lot of us start to are starting to theorize that the future is really many venues getting the same experience so that instead of having to go to New York to watch an event, you could go to in many and potentially them all interacting with each other. But, but, the, but, but being able to control the lights, being able to control the cameras, being able to pass all the audio and video back and forth between those venues becomes really important. Um, John, but you I have something, oh, go, go ahead, Mark. I was just going to add that this is the kind of thing that SIT, the organization in Canada, is already envisioning, yeah. right? They're thinking about this stuff. That's part of why that they wanted the tool to be able to do it. It's incredible. Uh, John, you wanted to add, add something there? 
Hey, Mark, uh, and and Elle's here too. Good to see you. I just wanted to give some public thanks to Elle and letting letting us borrow Elle in, in after hours. He's, he's <laughs> super helpful. We built the kit car light going back and forth, and it was much more complicated than we originally thought. And we also built beer bubbles bubbling up in their frequency. <laughs> there we go. Exactly. exactly. So I wanted well, I, can, I wanted to publicly thank you for the use yeah. of L. Thanks. Well, I can probably make L publicly blush by saying it has nothing to do with this, but we just did a massive show in Berlin, uh, part of a residency for artists who are learning to use media. We did twelve completely different technology pieces in a single day eight you know performances and every single one of them had a completely different tech setup and the lone technician to make that day go smoothly which it went perfectly was l so i'm not surprised <laughs> you're all in <laughs> very good hands yeah yeah, yeah exactly yeah. exactly yeah. But it, uh, i mean i think he got an extra gray hair he looked a little mm -hmm. bit more like me at the end of it but <laughs> yeah, exactly. it, somehow it worked out Let's go jump into the questions and we'll come back to more discussion. Okay, uh, cool. All right, uh, let's go to the first question. And it's from David Brady in New York, New York. So what is IzzyCast and how secure is it? <clears throat> Excuse my voice. Our InfoSec group has a very stringent procedure to vet vendors where our IP is involved, especially if it needs to leave our network. Is there an open, excuse me, on-premise plan? Go ahead, Al. Um, Andy, correct me if I'm wrong here, but since we're using the Zoom architecture, I believe it's as secure as Zoom. Yeah, I won't I won't make any specific claims uh, just because I'm not educated enough on this. and I don't want to speak out of turn. However, it is the Zoom protocol. It is the Zoom cloud architecture. It is the same ingredients that are used to make the Zoom client. Um, when it comes to the actual handling of the pixel buffers, the audio streams and the data, it's the same ingredients that are used to build the Zoom client and to make all of those connections. So, um, it you know, I, I don't know exactly how that maps onto your organization's security policies. Uh, obviously, there are additional components that are deployed here in order to make it compatible with Isadora, um, you know, such as the web server to be able to manage the uh, allocation of user tokens and tracking and, uh, you know, minute calculations and things like that. Um, so I don't want to make a certification as to, you know, uh, whether or not this will work implicitly with your organization's security policies. But again, the, you know, we're not, it's not like a WebRTC backend or some other protocol here. It's, it's the same ingredients that are used to build Zoom. Yeah, and that has been a huge challenge. Anytime we start to have sites talk, talking to each other, dealing with the protocols and how are we going to get in and out and asking people to open up new ports and and, uh, and everything else has always turned out to be a little bit of a nightmare. So um, it's great. It's a great uh, platform there. Uh, next question. From Douglas Carmichael, Bitwig, the DAW man, man, uh, maker, recently introduced a paid add-on, Spectral Audio Processing, on top of the yearly upgrade plan price, and users are fuming. With IzzyCast being in the same category, how will you retain the trust of your user ca uh, community? Go ahead, Alan. Uh, I, I think the answer to this one is pretty easy, and it's that uh, you're not forced to use this. You only have to pay for it if you want to use it. So it, it's not an increase in price. It, it, it's yeah, not an increase in price for anyone who already has Isadora. If someone's not going to use this feature, then they don't have to pay for it at all. Yeah. Andy. So uh, I, don't, I don't think it's a violation of, of anyone's trust. Yeah, Andy. Yeah, I was just going to say that it, it's, a, you know, it's part of this modular package, right? So if you want these additional plugins external to the core Isidore product, again, this is where, you know, uh, again, it's the Zoom Video SDK, which is a, you know, commercially licensed uh, product from Zoom. Um, so there is, the, there is uh, you know, costs to the company uh, for deploying that. Um, and so I think Mark has uh, really thought through this very carefully and, and made sure that uh, users are going to be in really good shape. Um, I think it's going to have, you know, pretty aggressive pricing on it. But I also think that like, you know, we said, we're not, for, you know, he's not subsidizing with all users or having to pay for features that only some will use, right? It's, it's, I think he's, he's taken a very careful approach to that. But I, but I, if I can add, I want to add something mm -hmm. to that, if I can, um, you know, it's really important to me, you know, I've been doing this, I've been working on this project for 20 years and our user community, as you all probably all know, are just really such an incredible group of people with such generosity and, so there is a lot of trust that we've built up over the years. And I think that uh, one thing is that, you know, I spent some energy on something that is a very specific thing, which is going to open a door to a different kind of use for Isadora. But I want to say here in front of everyone that 
I am committed to making sure Isadora is always what it, it has the qualities that it has always had. And that is to make it really easy for people to create all kinds of theater, interactive art and whatever, like that's a community that I'm part of that community. So I'm never gonna leave that community. This is a new product that some other people from a different kind of community may start to use. And that's really, that's good for everybody because it's gonna make Isadora stronger in the long run. So I just I just wanted to say it in that way because um, yeah, it's just like that community is what made Isadora and we will never abandon them. Yeah. I, and I, yeah, go, go ahead, Al. Uh, I, I'd also say that like, the only reason that this is paid is because it has to be. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, not, Whenever, it's not an imaginary like, cost. We, we, <laughs> like we never like, we never set out to make any feature right. a paid feature. We only do it when we absolutely have to. Like, for example, Mark spun up and put out a free version of Siphon Virtual Webcam based on OBS's code. Like we could have charged ten, fifteen dollars for that, but we decided it was better to put it out free um, because that's the way the company is. And that's one of the major reasons that I work for the company is, is Mark is dead set on on keeping things affordable for artists. Yeah. I would say that I would be charging a lot more for a lot of different things if it was me because I, I well, want, and, and, and no, I, I get where you're coming from. And this is the the, the thing, but, uh, you know, for, but honestly, Alex, you know, I mean, this is why I hesitated. I'm not really saying anything about pricing because I'm really thinking about this too, about, you know, how, this this is a whole new pricing structure. We have no history with it. I can do right. with it whatever I want. And I have some ideas about how to make this work in a broad sense for a lot of different users at, from different fields, let's say. And so that's something that I, you know, I don't know the answers yet, but I'm coming towards the answers and we're exploring. Yeah, it's 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 just really exciting. And and I think that there's a lot of people who are, you know, I think that it's it's great that you're looking for making it affordable for everyone because there's a massive market out there that's going to be price insensitive <laughs> to 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 what this is doing. I mean, because there's just mm -hmm. nothing else like it that moves that that can move the data, audio, and video together. Usually, what happens is when we start talking about doing these things, well, we got this this protocol for this and this protocol for that, and I've got to go pull all these things in, and being able to have one interface that grabs it on one end and the other on the other, you know, being able to do that all in one. Uh, environment I don't I've never seen before so it's it's, yeah. it's going to be really interesting yeah. next question and from Talalek Miguel Lopez Waterman in Honolulu Hawaii he's traveling hello Mark I'm so excited to try IzzyCast thank you for making it I think it will find many uses in the theater world thanks <laughs> well, the, the other thing I'll add was, so when I was at IBC, uh, I heard that you were very excited that I was tall, but even more excited that you were taller than me. I think Tlaloc's taller than 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 everyone. <laughs> so, 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 so it's like maybe not. I mean, you know, not not everyone, but a lot a lot of people. Like every, 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 I think everybody's first comment when they meet Tlaloc is that he's a lot taller than I expected. Um, yeah. So the um, uh, you know, I think that beyond the theater world as well, I think that the just the remote event world or the event world in general, not even just remote event world, but being able to, you know, at every event now we're tying people together. You know, we're, we're bringing remote guests in, we're um, tying in remote locations. And I've been doing this for the last, I've been tying, doing those things and stumbling through this for the last decade. And so it's, it's, it has been, you know, what this is solving. The reason that I was so excited to have you on is it, it's solving some really key issues that I've had for 10 years, you know, um, and being able to have this all wrapped up is very exciting. Uh, let's go to the next question. And from Douglas Carmichael, Mark, you mentioned uses for IzzyCast in the broadcast enterprise spaces. With Isidore's roots in the academic arts community, will there be still a free and or lower cost tier to enable innovators and experimenters to learn and build on IzzyCast? Um, well, I mean, the pricing structure for Isidore itself, um, we have no major plans at the moment to change any of that. So again, you can go get Isadora just the way it is, and that's not changing at all because of IzzyCast. IzzyCast, what I I don't I don't think I can make it free because in the end I have to pay for those minutes. Like when I when you used IzzyCast, that means Troikatronics is charged by Zoom for those minutes, and somehow I've got to recoup those costs. Um, could it be that we will consider some kind of a, a way to allow experimenters to work with this? Maybe um, that would be something I haven't, I can't say that I've thought about it in any detail, mm -hmm. but 
I can imagine a situation where that might be. So, yeah. Go ahead, Andy. Scale changes everything, right? So, you know, once, uh, you know, if there's a, a billion users, you know, um, of, of Izzy Cast, right? Then, you know, then I think there's, it's a different conversation. I think, you know, um, we have to look at, you know, how the, how the market reacts to the, to the plugins and what the, what the situation is at that point. Um, but I also think that, you know, even, even under a commercial use situation, this is going to enable a different tier of user to participate with these concepts that has previously been priced out of this category. We talked about, you know, uh, private fiber and all that other stuff and what, you know, how there is a precedent for these pay by the minute, but you know, either the technical complexity was off the charts with having to run your own WebRTC servers and having to deal with that complexity, or maybe you're doing point to points, you need to understand networking, port forwarding, all of that stuff. Um, that user was either out of scope because of technical complexity or uh, the turnkey solutions price them out uh, of being able to use it. And I think that IzzyCast is going to come into an area uh, where you're going to see uh, adoption um, in a new in a new market, e even even under um, a commercial uh, setting. Go ahead, Al. I I will also say that um, people looking to experiment with it, especially um, in the academic field should have access to um, and should be able to make good cases for, for grants in order to get the minutes to, to experiment with this. And there are also companies like, uh, I believe it's Epic Games funds all sorts of um, technology grants for people doing interesting things, not just with gaming. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, next question. Alexander Knight from Vancouver, BC, Canada, and right here on the panel, is Isadora Overkill for use on podcast productions? It would be neat if I could automatically trigger my DMX lights to turn on when the audio input is detected, as well as turn off the lights after silence is detected for a period of time. Go ahead, Al. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that Isadora is overkill for, for anything. I mean, we've had, we've had users who, you know, did motion tracking of their goldfishes in a fish tank and had that play midi notes. It's like, it's, it's all about like what you want to use it for, but also, you know, people like people using it at the Met, Cirque du Soleil. And, and there are people who run escape rooms using Isadora. So it's, it's incredibly flexible. So I, I think it's only overkill if what you're trying to do doesn't need like any element of interactivity. Because as soon as you involve interactivity or, or processing data from the real world, like, you know, detecting sound level, turn on light, that's something that Isadora can make really easy for you. For, I'd like to quote the, the philosopher Ferris Bueller. It says, first of all, you can never go too far. So, so, you know, so, so the, um, uh, so, but the, I, I will, I will say that, uh, what you're asking for there, I think is actually something that you could probably do without is a cast. It's just, that's just an Isadora problem. Um, as far as local things, it's really what happens remotely, um, that, that this is, that is a cast will really affect or is cast will really affect the, uh, I'm really getting my head around it. And as we start to test is cast, what I'm really interested in is thinking through, the process of being able to send, so with with own I know and with um, and with what we do with um, the the gray matter podcast, we're sending kits out to people all the time. Kit 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 kit. I want you. I want to bring you in as a contributor. And right now we're using Zoom for that. And we may still continue to use Zoom for it for you know quite quite some time. But I can see how IzzyCast could be something that. I send out a bunch of kits now and I could even send some lights out with some DMX or some other, you know, um, if we can figure out a way to talk to the little Insta 360s <laughs> so we can, you know, um, you know, those types of things, you know, I can now have an interface that I designed myself that is sitting at, at my home in my home uh, control and I can control the lights and I can control potentially the mic levels and all the other things that are there on that remote host. And for the, you know, the kind of things that we've done, I mean, we've brought, we've had people, you know, we uh, have had people talk to heads of state, we've had people talk to actors and basketball players and all these other things. And we send out all these kids to do that. And it's just kind of a nightmare, you know, like, as we're telling them, like, how to do this, and I need you to turn your light a little bit more or whatever. Now I could just say, here's a setup, just set it all up and plug these cables back into this. And now I have total control over their space and I can change the color and their mic and their, you know, potentially their little PTZ camera, everything else can all be tied back in um, to make that work. And, and I think that that's, um, it's pretty exciting. 
you know, well, that's and, and, I, and that's and that's why we did precisely that at our demo. I mean, yes, we yep. were using a dance studio with DMX lights and the grid and, you know, whatever. But the the concept that we presented was exactly that concept. Yep. You send a kit and you can do it all from remotely. Exactly. And and there's so much. I mean, everyone's been doing this, but they've been hacking through all these different things and, and having one interface. And again, what happens is, is that when you now have all the tools of Isadora, that are sitting on top of that, I don't have to rewrite code for everything I want to control. There are nodes for that. <laughs> like, so I can sit there and build a node, you know, low code node structure of this is what I wanna do and build a little interface that I can push the buttons. Everyone else that's been doing these remote control sessions have been really writing the code, you know, from plain cloth, you know, and not being able to just grab something and say, well, I, th that interaction is free now. And all I have to do is now add the, the things that I wanna add to it, um, I think that that's going to, you know, it, it's going to change the way we do remote contribution forever. You know, as soon as, as soon as this really comes up to speed, it's really exciting. Um, next question. Palalik Moat Miguel Lopez Waterman from Honolulu asks, are there any plans to have more audio input channels for Isadora? Some of the work we're doing with Todd Reynolds, we used multiple channels of audio to do graphical things in his stream. We wanted more than four stereo inputs. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I don't know. Um, are you, uh, the answer is yes. The answer is yes. We plan to make that increase that number um, in the next, in the next major release of Isadora. Um, but also I want to make sure that you're aware. Do you know that you can plug in like a 16 channel audio device into one of those inputs and you can get each of the channels from that multi-channel audio device so, cause I think what, what Tlock is talking about here. So I think they're doing stuff. We have the audio input coming into Zadora. We analyze either the frequency or generally the volume is what mostly gets used. And then you can use that volume number to change stuff, to manipulate video or whatever. And so typically you just plug in your normal microphone, you get a single, uh, maybe a stereo signal, and then you send those numbers out and modify something else. But if you plug in an eight channel audio device or a 16 channel audio device in the live capture settings window, you'll see that they're available. And then there's the um, the sound level watcher plus plus. Is that right, L? Anyway, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. OK, I, the, <laughs> I forget the names of my own modules. But anyway, there's a module that allows you to get at all the exactly the channels you want. So actually, you can have a whole lot of channels right now without changing anything if you use a multi-channel interface as the input. Uh, next question. Juan C. Robles in Mexico City, Mexico. Is IzzyCast a user actor within Isadora or a standalone that interfaces with Isadora? Go ahead, uh, IzzyCast no, is, a, is a collection of four uh new actors coded in c plus plus they are not user actors that we will distribute uh so isadora itself like i said isn't really changing uh these actors now we're taking this first step right because this really does this will allow people to do everything we need uh i can imagine being able to do some things like adding a thing to the user interface of Isadora itself that will access your portal, generate your ID that you need and give it to you like in a, in a instead of doing that in the actor that it does now, that it does that in a, in a user interface element, a window or a panel in Isadora, I can totally see that happening. That will be a next step because, you know, Andy talks about scaling up and I'm just a big believer in like, I want to get this working and because it'll totally do everything we needed to do with the actors and using Isadora's control panel, we can actually simulate most of what I just said. But I can definitely see that we could really put these things in Isadora itself eventually. So it's kind of, that's my plan. We get these actors working, we make nice user interfaces in the control panel. And then the next step, when we see how people really use it and we find out what's happening, then we start modifying Isadora itself to do some of this stuff. Question for you. So when we, let's say we send it out to a remote, a remote guest. Yeah. You're sending, we're sending them essentially Isadora. No, they don't have to pay for it because as long as they don't change it, it's free, right? That's right. And can, is there a way to set it up so that when you hit go, it just automatically just opens up to an interface that we choose? Um, 
Yeah. And well, if they double click the file, the Isadora file you give them, it would do that. It, okay, if you great. double click Isadora, it would not automatically open that file. I mean, that's an interesting point. I mean, it's actually not so hard to do. But if you actually instructed them to double click the file itself, then they're going to be right in the user interface. And as soon and once they're there, the only thing they have to do to connect, I mean, this is exactly what I did in the demo. They take the 10 digit code you give them, they type it in, they paste it into the control panel and they hit connect and they're, and it's there. they're, and they're on. And, it's, and that's, but what they're seeing there is not Isadora. It's the interface that you've designed. Yeah. You see the, you see the, the control panel elements. You don't see the actors. You see nothing. I mean, in the actual demo, the only four elements that were there for the talent were the code, the thing to enter the code, uh, uh, join and leave buttons mm -hmm. and then a little bit a little window to give them feedback about what their video looked like so they could see themselves locally that's the only controls that they had on that side of the connection yeah i will also say that in that in that uh, scenario you outlined earlier of like shipping full package to your client you can ship them a laptop with just isadora file on the desktop or, or or set it up so that and, when it opens up, I could if yeah, I had remote could, control over that, I just item. open it and they don't have yeah. to do anything, right? Yeah, put it in put it in uh, task manager or whatever mm -hmm. in the automatic startup script, and you know you could even go so far as to if you if you have a chance to intercept these kits before you send them back out, you could preset the meeting code because you can we re can reserve that ahead of time. Yeah. And now immediately, you know, when that thing you know opens up, it could be just going connects. into there. There's a whole again. If you ever wanted Zoom to work a different way, <laughs> you yeah. know, this is your opportunity to customize how how Zoom behaves, right? Because it's all the ingredients that you like about the protocol, but you have the ability to build whatever behavior on top of that that you're looking for in terms of the flow, right? And that's that's what's so exciting well, to me about this. I'm sorry, I'm just getting pretty excited. So, so the thing is, is that, that you can, but because you have Isadora, <laughs> Because you have Isadora, that means that you can, I can send back data. So one of the problems that we have, I mean, I've been doing these for a decade now, so I've got a thousand under my belt that, I, that this may solve a lot of the things. But the one of the things about it is, is that we want to send different data and different information back to each person. So, mm -hmm. so if I'm, you know, you, they're all coming in, they're all discussing it. I want to send the host, I need to have heads up displays like, I need to have a timer for them. I need to have the next questions. I need to have all these other bits and pieces. You know, I need to be able to potentially have individual audio for them that in, in addition to what they're hearing, they're hearing all the other people talking to each other, but theoretically I can send back, talk back and so on and so forth to them. Um, and so, and, and potentially then cue other things for them, you know, within their environment. But I, I need that for the host and then I need something else for possibly the, um, the, you know, all the other participants, but I still may want to send all that. Now in the past, what we've done is we've gone through a lot of trouble to composite things over it and then send them another, a different video feed. But now I can simply send the data to a, to a layer that is compositing that sitting over top of it because I have all the, all the tools of Isadora. So I can set up all that stuff and that's all being rendered locally. It's not some junky, you know, compressed, you know, text file that's being sent over it. I can, I could even break it up so they see 1080p and then all that data is around it and all that other thing. And it's not, it's not, I'm not stuck in a 1920 by 1080 world. Um, that's right. That's all exactly right. And then, but let's think about, I, you're now you're prompting me to think about a use case I didn't actually consider. Let's think about it for just a second because mm -hmm. So let's say you're the director and what you just said, if I got it right, was I need to send certain things to different people in, in the in the inside of the connection. Right. Mm -hmm. So out of the box, right at this moment, although, you know, anything can change, you know, I'm uh, but at the moment, like you could have an actor, one of the Izzy cast receivers, and you would designate the source as host. Let's say your your username mm -hmm. is host. Right. Yep. So at that point, all of the data there's one channel. Well, yeah, there's there's one channel of data. I mean, you could do eight channels of data. Maybe that's one way to do it. But what comes to mind, which allows me to say what else we've been working on lately, is that um, the other thing that is in beta testing right now is we have a new Python actor inside of Isadora. So you can run Python locally inside of Isadora. So right. one thing that would be really easy to do, you just send out JSON strings and they have targets like they have the person that's supposed to get the message. And then you can either use the JSON actors we have, or if you want something super intelligent, you could use this new Python actor or JavaScript. We can do the same thing probably. Mm -hmm. And you could use that to, to yank out the bits you need for that particular target. Yep. So in other words, like 
as it stands right now, of course, I'm really, I really want to hear feedback from this community. I want to know mm -hmm. like what your use cases are, because I mean, frankly, Andy's been educating me. I mean, I, because again, right. I come from, I come from theater and that's my background, but Andy right. has told me about a lot of yeah. different use cases. And so I'm really happy to hear from, you know, all of you about that. But the bottom line is like, there is a way that's the thing about Isadora. There's always a way. And so yeah. your thing that you just said about, I need to send text to very specific people by doing a little bit of coding, either in Python or in the JavaScript actor, you could pull that out, or maybe it's just a matter of using more channels of data. I don't know. But, well, could I, but with IzzyCast, could I just have multiple actor, IzzyCast actors that are going to different people? Well, the way it works is that, so like, again, you have to imagine, like, let's say that, you know, uh, you, me, Andy, and L, we're all connected, right, in different locations in IzzyCast. All that's going up to the cloud and to Zoom, right. right? Got it. So each of us can have as many, uh, we can each have an IzzyCast receiver actor, one that says Andy, one that says Alex, one that says L, and we can be pulling your audio, video, and data from that person, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, because, and also it's important to say that it's not just the director who can get this. Everybody who's part of this potentially has the ability to pull the images and sound back into their computer, you know, right. using the system. So, but like, because what I just heard you say was something a little bit different. I was addressing the idea that you need to, at a certain time, send text to this person, but at a different time, send text to them. That's you're correct. still the, you're still the host. So we need mm -hmm. a way now of routing that data. But of course, it's totally possible. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. yeah. I definitely emphasize that it is doable. Uh, and there's a variety of things. Again, we're, this is built on uh, command channel inside of video SDK, as well as a couple other things. I mean, there's also chat based ways of sending things that are, you know, chat, but it can be, it can be text, you know, that you could use for all sorts of different purposes, right. And direct those streams. Um, but I did want to just say that like, yeah, the idea of command channel is very akin to like what Streamweaver was, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it's, it's a lot of the same spirit of that, that you're, that you're seeing, uh, in the IzzyCast product. The other thing I would mention to your earlier point, um, is that let's not forget that Isadora can also export to deck link cards or NDI or siphon or all of those similar protocols that like zoom ISO could be used for. You could pull all those participants in and then you can shoot them all out of a deck link into a more conventional production stack as well. So it's not that you are trapped inside of just using software layer uh, tools, you can break that out into external devices like the deck link, like NDI networks, like Siphon for Interprogram. Um, and so and you, is it, you is it as conventional tools. Is it as efficient as what's happening in Zoom ISO as far as um, how it's talking to the card, the black magic card? So the SDK. Yeah. So yeah. so we so I, I, and Mark can correct me if I'm wrong, but Zoom ISO uses the desktop video SDK and I assume that Isadora does as well. Yeah, but you you said you had some really good tricks going on. You were down to the metal in Apple Silicon, <laughs> weren't you? Yeah, there's a lot of things that you know that I think um, you know I, I don't think that Zoom ISO and IzzyCast are necessarily competing because the the spirit of IzzyCast is building a customized session architecture, whereas Zoom ISO is designed specifically to operate within Zoom meetings and webinars. Like IzzyCast doesn't connect to an existing Zoom meeting or an existing Zoom webinar, right? Uh, that's where Zoom ISO comes in. But a lot of the same ideas of the applications, you, know, you can right. do similar things in Isadora that you could do for that type of session that you could do in Zoom ISO. Yeah, I mean, like for instance, th there's a lot of creature comforts that we have inside of this Zoom session that we use for office hours that we'd probably want to continue to use Zoom ISO for. But there's a lot of places that are much more bespoke that we would absolutely want to design a session for um, inside of inside of Isadora. It's really fascinating. Um, next question. Talalik Miguel Lopez Waterman in Honolulu asked, we made a super title routing actor for a recent opera. With a little work, I think it could be useful for others. Is there an appropriate way to share it? Simply upload on the forum or some other way? Go ahead, Elle. Add-ons page. Yeah. We have an add-ons page. So originally people would share all their wonderful creative solutions to things and example patches and stuff that would be useful to other, other Isadora users on our forum. But it's, you know, the most recent post goes at the top. So eventually anything shared in the forum gets buried. So we created with the launch of Isidore 3, a separate page that is specifically an archive for things that you want to share with others that you want to have preserved in a place where other people can look them up and, and download them and give feedback. You can also comment on things on that page. Next question. 
Chris Widener from Lafayette, Indiana. Chris asks, you have my head swirling with notions. If you have a virtual interface with 64 channels, will Isidore then see and be able to use all 64 channels? A virtual interface, what I, I need to be clarified if they means audio or what? Yeah, I think probably like something like Dante virtual sound card or something like that, where yeah, you know, I mean, it's not a physical card. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Isadora, you know what? I don't want to claim that 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 okay, we're what we're talking about, what I mentioned earlier is that in the live capture settings dialogue where you set up the live inputs, the cameras and the audio, you can select a multi-channel audio device and then you can pull out individual channels of that and monitor the volume. Okay, that's what's possible. Now, have I tried it with a 64 input device? Not actually. I assume it probably works, but you know what? I can't promise you because I never really tried it. I've tried it with a 16 channel device and I know it works with that. So in theory for that process, you can do that. But um, I, so if you're, if that's the idea, I mean, you can try it right now. If you hook up, you know, a black hole or you uh, use a Soundflower, you can have 64 channels. You can bring that in right now and experiment with it and you should be able to access them. I think it's possible. Yeah, and once you start getting to 64 channels, you start thinking about stuff like Unity Connect as well. I mean, just passing, you know, there's a, there's tools for that <laughs> that do that really well. You're going to say, L? Uh, I was going to say, for anyone who's watching who's unfamiliar with Isadora, um, you can download Isadora for free and use all the features except for IzzyCast right now because that's not publicly available, but you can use all the features for free. The only limitation of the demo version of the software is that you can't save. So if you want to try something like this, if you want to see if you're if your 64 channel audio routing idea works, you can you can do that, absolutely, and you don't need to pay anything to try it. Yeah, go ahead, Mitchell. Chris confirms that is for 64 audio channels. Yep. Yeah. yeah, so, yeah, but there's there's tools that are built for that, and it's, it's not a trivial problem to keep them all in mm -hmm. sync and, and to move them around, and it's not really, I think that uh, there's a lot of other ways to, to, to make that happen. Um, next question. Lalek is back questioning, and uh, how does the data move? Does Izzy need to start a new meeting participant for data, or is that all on a separate pipe? Go ahead, Alan. Uh, the IzzyCast broadcaster has a, a video input and then as many data inputs as you want. So it's just, I mean, if you know broadcast and listener already in Isadora, it, it sort of shows up that same way. It's just oh, yeah, I, uh, IzzyCast listener. I am fascinated by the idea because I think that then then it sends to the as a broadcaster. So you couldn't could you have multiple broadcasters in one location to send to different people individually, or is it really designed as a shared a shared the, environment? My understanding, I've not. I, this is something I still have to code is the ability to have this. But my understanding is that the Zoom Video SDK allows up to three different distinct sources in the same session on the same computer. And Andy can correct me if I've got that wrong. Yeah, so specific. So that's for the video channels. So a single um, instance should be able to pull in three different video feeds and push them up uh, from a single instance of our SDK. Now, I think the question reflects the data channel. Again, this is what we call command channel inside of the video SDK. Mm -hmm. And the way that command channel works um, is that it basically um, it's, it's a metadata stream that can show up uh, just as another um, uh, stream alongside of your video and your audio uplinks. Um, and then the question really becomes on the developer, how do you want to uh, handle the distribution of that channel to right. endpoints? And that's based on like a subscription architecture um, that you can manage in a variety of different ways. So I think that um, the behavior that you're looking for, for like a directed stream to an individual person is absolutely possible. But you have to think that the, you know, we're giving the ingredients to do something yep. like that. Um, it's kind of like and, a message board. Uh, exactly. And, and it would be very much like black magic, how black magic talks to all its cameras. It actually sends all the data for all the cameras to, you know, so out all the time and just simply identifies what camera I'm talking to right now. So that, so it's doing that constantly. So th what you're talking about is a totally, uh, it's been, we use that in SDI all the time, you know, with, with black magic cameras to talk to them. So very akin to that. Yeah. And also it'd be very easy. Uh, you were talking earlier about like sending specific messages to specific people. Um, if you've seen any of Andy's, um, list selector interfaces for, for zoom calls where you can click. So, IzzyCast also gives you a list of the participants in the meeting. So you can feed that to the list selector, then it auto-populates this selectable list 
with the list of participants in your meeting. Right. And then like Andy's interface, you can have a text control and a send button. So you can click on someone, mm. type something and send. And yeah. then since you're distributing these, these files to the, the other endpoints, you can pre-program their names and then you have something that intercepts the, the data out that says, this message is for John, is my yeah. name John? If not, don't pass it. If my name is John, then pass it through and show it. And so it'll, it'll cut it off from everyone, but the person you're trying to send it to. No, and you absolutely. can also, you can also, you know, use that in the same way to, to make big countdowns with big letters on the screen. You can make cue lights for people just by, you know, blinking well, things on and, and off. And again, the, the, one of the big things that we have is being able to send them back. It's much less bandwidth because I don't have to send them multiple video feeds to give them the heads up displays that, that I require. And I also don't have to build all the compositing in, at, in my, my home office. I can simply do all of that work and it can look really pretty. You know, because I can, I have it as a local composite um, that's sitting over top of it. I, yeah, it's groundbreaking. Uh, next, uh, next question. From Douglas Carmichael. Douglas asks, when I built a patch to send MIDI clock to a groove box, I was not able to maintain a stable clock at high beats per minute, even when increasing the general service task to 30 times per frame. Are there plans to improve the core timing stability of the Isadora engine? Well, you know, oh, go, ahead. Oh, yeah, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead Sorry, Alex. No, no, no. Go ahead, Mark. Yeah, I think I'm probably I'm the only one who can answer this anyway. Um, you know, that is such a tricky part of any program is this like how to keep it kind of real time. And what you're asking in terms of accuracy is a pretty tall ask, because let's say you're doing 180 beats per minute. MIDI clock has to go out at 24 times that, right? If I remember my MIDI right, you have to send 24 pulses for every beat per minute. So that's 180 by times 24. I don't even know what that number is, but it's a lot. And to try to have Isadora send out a MIDI clock with that kind of accuracy, I, I'm not quite sure how you would do that. And I'm not quite sure if you were in, in, in uh, yeah. So I just think like, um, so the answer is, what you're trying to do is incredibly difficult in a lot of situations, I would say, unless you're programming at a very low level. I mean, but what? the answer is yes, I always want that clock to be more accurate and faster, but there are limitations that we have to live by. Jason, do you want to add anything to that? I mean, so MIDI is transmitted asynchronously at um, uh, 31,250 31, bytes per second. Um, <laughs> Like the, I, I hate to say it, but like in, in this case, it, that's not really what Isadora is for. Um, like, I, I don't know, maybe I'm yeah. wrong. I mean, well, <laughs> let me, it's a little bit different, Jason, because the, yes, that is the, exactly right. The frequency of MIDI, but what is happening here, what the person is trying to do is basically let's for people in broadcast, think of it as SMPTE, the SMPTE time code, there's 80 bits for every frame or something like that. And when it was on audio anyway, right, there was 80 bits for every frame. So that's like how the, the resolution of every frame. So it's actually, if you're going at 25 frames per second, it's 25 times 80. That's the resolution of a bit in SMPTE. In MIDI terms, when you're doing um, a MIDI clock, the idea, this was to drive, have one sequence or drive another. And so it would take every beat and divide it, if again, if my memory serves, into 24 pieces. So uh, he's not driving locally. Now I understand. Okay. Yeah. But, but the thing is, is that I just did them. I just opened the calculator to multiply it. If the if he said high BPM, I'm guessing that means either 160 or 180 or something like that beats per minute. But if let's say it's 180, that's 4,320 pulses per second, right? So that you know is is less. It's like into microseconds now. That's the kind of resolution that we're talking about, and it's just like. That's just pretty tough to do unless you're at an extremely low level. Well, and and I can tell you that we would not trust a time clock coming from a computer without the crystal set that we use. You know, like the, when you're talking about like this kind of le level of precision, you need specialized hardware <laughs> for, yeah. for this. Not, you know, not expecting a computer to ever generate anything with that level of accuracy. It's just not what computers are designed for. Um, you know, I mean, like when we, and just to, to final compliment that, you know, there were some people that wanted to be able to send MIDI time code, which also has a high resolution. I code that is in Isadora. You can send out MIDI time code from Isadora, but that's done way down deep, really low in its own thread to be able to try and get the accuracy you need mm -hmm. to send those pulses out.
Absolutely. So, so what's the future? How is this, how is this rolling out? What's the next plan? When do we get it? More importantly, when can I have it? Is the you know, like, let's, let's get down to that. Let's get another thing. When Alex do doesn't care it? about any of us. Just throw these people off the bus. Let's throw these people off the bus. Yeah. So, so anyway, uh, no. But but when? What? What's the real? What? What are you working on? All right. So here's the deal. Um, we want to go into a, a private beta with selected participants in November. I got some more coding to do to add some a couple of these things like the multiple video streams. So that's like November, but I want to, I definitely want to have this publicly available as early into 2023 as possible. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like this week, you know, it was like my mind was distracted because it's like Mac OS Ventura comes out probably next week and we're just yeah. like dealing with that, blah, blah, blah. But I think that's off my case now because I think we got this all working. So you can have it soon. We can, let's talk, you and me, we can talk. <laughs> But but for private beta in November yeah. and then in for the public starting early in 2023 is my plan. And on That's the Zoom happen. side, you know, we're really excited. We have our our annual user conference coming up, Zoomtopia, on November 8th. Um, and as you saw, this you know, at least in in our area of like media, um, IzzyCast was something that we were really excited to show at IBC. I think at the time we also said that you know we hope to have more to share around Zoomtopia as part of the celebration of features that are both you know things that we've accomplished this year and are things that are in the near future. You know that's going to be I think another point where we should check in and see what's you know what's the latest uh, and um, look at you know maybe additional demos or things like that that we can share at that time. I know Mark's goal is like you said to do an invited beta sometime around you know that that Zoomtopia conference um, as another check in point and maybe we can come back and share a little bit more at that time. Great yeah, I'd like to. I, I'd like to say that I think it would be great if we could head towards another. On our next visit, Alex, I want you to be the director, and I'm going to be the talent, and we're going to let's do so, let's do it for real, and let's really see what it's like. I, mean, I will crew that for free. I'm just going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds great. So we'll start we'll start working on that. Uh, Mark, L, and Andy, thank you so much for dropping in and making such a great session. We're super excited about IzzyCast and and just can't wait to obviously can't wait to dig into it. And I think it's a really groundbreaking piece of piece of work. So all right. So thank you so much. Thanks for a lot time. for having us. Yeah, take care. Thanks to our producers for all the all the great questions, uh, keeping this thing rolling. And thanks to our highly efficient, highly effective panel today. We can't do this without you. There's a lot of great answers that were just like boom, 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 boom. It was really, really, really well done. And of course, thanks to the incredible crew on the back end that is making all of this work. I mean, every day, just a reminder, people watching every day, we have this small village that appears from all over the world that puts this show together. So we really appreciate all of your work. So thanks so much. Um, and a uh, reminder, we've education hour, we're gonna talk about remote education, which will probably be affected by this <laughs> is cast uh, in the future. But we'll be talking about that on Saturday. Um, so stay tuned for that. Um, and it's going to be uh, tomorrow, tomorrow, Saturday, I think. And uh, anyway, we'll see you now we're going to jump into after hours. Man, that was awesome. Oh, man. My head is spinning. Seriously, crew that meeting. No, I don't think Mark knows about the whispering bit. This is the I don't quiet know. room. This is know. the quiet room. This is where we, we just kind of finish up the show. But I really, I really need to get his cast. So, so we'll work on that. But I'm, I'm in the middle of, I'm, I'm still doing the Zoom ISO thing right now. So last night I spent, I spent a little time building aggregated audio devices. Andy will be very proud of me. So proud of you. <laughs> audio MIDI setup. Uh, <laughs> So I was banging, banging on aggregated audio devices. So we'll have that working this t today. I got it all worked out up, up here. I have to go down to the office because that's where my, my SD card good. is. And Very good. All right. Off we go. So do we leave now? Yep. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Bye. Bye-bye.